speak. Okay. Please, we are going to start the personnel committee at 7 o'clock. And before we get started, we need to elect a clerk of, of this committee. So do I have any nominations? Alderman Lopez. I would like to nominate Ben Clements because he's already sitting there. <laughs> Don't let any my other sitting nominations? Here. <laughs> he looks like he's coming. No, nominations are closed. All those in favor of Alderman Clemens being the clerk of the human of, uh, ooh, personnel advisory administration committee say aye. Aye. aye aye opposed okay welcome aboard thank you okay so i will ask you to please call the roll um chairman karen here alderwoman shoshana kelly here alderman clemens is here alderman lopez here alderman gidge um Members also in attendance are Alderman Dowd, Alderman Laws, Alderman Jetty, Alderman Wilshire, and Corporation Counsel Steve Bolton. Okay, thank you. So this is the part that we do our public comment, and I see a lot of people in the audience. So uh, I would ask, I will call you up. You can raise your hand and then come to the front. You need to state your name and address, please. Uh, but we'd ask you to try to limit your speaking time so that we can get everybody at the mic tonight before we get into our business at hand. So who would like to lead the, the group? Step up. Okay, Chief, would you like to come forward? Thank you. Chief of the Police Department. I'm here uh, in support of resolution R19-120, which is the renaming of Panther Drive to James Roach Drive. And this is, uh, Officer Roach was shot and killed in 1928 in the line of duty. He's one of four national police officers killed in the line of duty. Sergeant John Yerkak um, is the uh, sergeant that spearheaded this, certainly with a tremendous amount of support and endorsement uh, from the aldermen. And we certainly, uh, you know, very much in favor of this. We think it's long overdue. Um, certainly this recognition, uh, I, I think, is, is appropriate. And it certainly frees up Panther Drive for if uh, National High School certainly uh, decides to take that uh, sort of uh, as Titan Way with the uh, National North Titans. And again, we are the only uh, building on Panther Drive uh, at this point. So certainly uh, we, the, the neighbors agree with us. <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. <laughs> okay, next. All right, come. Uh, hi, Jan. Good evening. My name is Janet Valuk. I live at 41. Why am I looking at my notes? I know where I live. <laughs> I live at 41 Roy Street, Nashua, New Hampshire, and I'm, I live in Ward 6. Um, I'm going to share with you first, and I know probably a lot of you have already seen this, and no, I did not take this ad out in the paper, although it could have been something that I would put in there in regards to raising the tobacco, um, the legal age to purchase tobacco products to 21. This is an ad, a paid advertisement by the company that now dominates the um, vaping industry so much to the point now where it's refer referred to as juuling. Um, they are the makers of the number one product, which is called the Jewel. Um, I'd like to encourage all of you to support um, the ordinance that has been introduced by Alderman Ernest Jetty, um, 019037. I feel raising the, t the age to 21 would be the best thing for Nashua youth, um, and here's some reasons. And, and I'll tell you that most of my reasons are um, based on science and facts, not just my opinion. In my conversation, which I did have a conversation with Chief Lavoy um, earlier in February, he stated that it will not cost the police department any extra money to enforce the age moving up to age 21. And he also no noted that, as with any ordinance passed by the Board of Aldermen, the police department will enforce it as they do with any ordinance that you pass. Stores that are licensed to sell alcohol and or tobacco can still utilize underage employees. Um, they don't have to be 21 to sell it. 
I spoke to the market basket manager from Somerset Plaza, and she said at our store, 16 and 17-year-olds can still sell as long as they are signed off by somebody. And I also understand that one of the uh, reasons to not raise the age is because at 18, in the state of New Hampshire, they're considered a legal adult. They can enlist into the military. They can take out college loans, et cetera. But if you look at those things, going to college, taking out a loan, serving the country, none of those actions will destroy their brains. ENDS, or electronic nicotine delivery systems. And here are some facts about that from some very reliable sources. Johns Hopkins Medicine reports that both e-cigarettes and regular cigarettes contain nicotine, which research, research suggests may be as addictive as heroin and cocaine. What's worse, many e-cigarette users get even more nicotine than they would from a regular tobacco product, as you can buy extra strength cartridges, which have a higher concentration of nicotine. Or you can increase the e-cigarette's voltage to get a higher hit, or a greater hit of the substance. American Cancer Society reports that although the term vapor may sound harmless, the aerosol, which it is actually an aerosol, not a vapor, that comes out of an e-cigarette is not water vapor, and it can be harmful. It can contain substances that are addictive and can cause lung disease, heart disease, and cancer. It's important to know that most e-cigarettes contain nicotine, and there is evidence that nicotine harms the brain development of teenagers. If used during pregnancy, nicotine may also call pre cause premature births and low birth weight babies. Besides nicotine, e-cigarettes and e-cigarette vapor contain propylene glycol and or vegetable glycerin. These are substances to produce stage or theatrical fog, which have been found to increase lung and airway irritation after concentrated exposure. In addition, e-cigarettes and e-cigarette vapor may contain the chemicals or substances listed below. Um, volatile organic compounds can cause eye, nose, and throat irritation, headaches and nausea, and can damage the liver, kidney, and nervous system. Flavoring chemicals, that some of them are more toxic than others. Studies have shown that flavors contain different levels of a chemical called diacetyl that has been linked to a serious lung disease called bronchiolitis obliterans and formaldehyde. This is a cancer-causing substance that may, that may form if e-liquid overheats or not enough liquid is reaching the heating element. The FDA does not currently require e-cigarette manufacturers to stop using potentially harmful substances. And I will say that diacetyl is approved to be ingested. So um, one of the results of this, um, of e-cigarettes is what's referred to as popcorn lungs. And it was um, identified in a factory that made microwave popcorn. And it's in the popcorn, you can eat it, but you can't inhale it. When you inhale it, it destroys your lungs. Um, it's difficult to know exactly what chemicals are in e-cigarettes because most products don't list all of the harmful or potentially harmful substances contained in them. Some products are also labeled incorrectly. Um, from the newest Surgeon General, on December 18th, Surgeon General Jerome Adams issued a rare advisory, the fourth in 10 years, from his office. I am officially declaring e-cigarette use among youth an epidemic in the United States. Why is nicotine unsafe for kids, teens, and young adults? First of all, it's the nicotine. It can harm the developing adolescent brain, and the brain keeps developing until the age of 25. If I had my druthers, I'd say raise the age to 25, along with alcohol and any other mind-altering substances. Um, using nicotine in adolescents can harm the parts of the brain that control attention, learning, mood, and impulse control. Each time a new memory is created or a new skill is learned, Stronger connections or synapses are built between brain cells. Young people's brains build synapses faster than adult brains, and nicotine, nicotine changes the way these synapses are formed. And it may also increase, increase risk for future addiction to other drugs. There's a lot of other risks involved, and unfortunately we're still scientists, not me, but scientists are still learning about the long-term health effects of e-cigarettes. Um, children and adults have been poisoned by swallowing, breathing, or absorbing e-cigarette liquid through their skin or eyes. And I also want to add that um, there has been an increased visit of um, owners with their pets to veterinarians because the, the, the pets have either licked up some of the, the um, e-juice that has spilled. 
The bottom line, and there's research to show this, is that the lower the perception of risk, the more likely a young person is to try something. Many ads say that e-cigarettes are a safer alternative to smoking and can help a person quit. But why do kids use them when they are not smokers at all? There's no reason to quit. From the FDA, again, e-cigarettes are not approved by the FDA as a quit smoking aid. So far, the research shows there is limited evidence that e-cigarettes are effective for helping smokers quit. There are other proven safe and effective methods for quitting smoking. Safer is not accurate. This is a fairly new product, and there is a lot of testing to be completed. In closing, I'd like to leave you with this. This is not a war on tobacco. It's not a war on the convenience stores or the people that sell these products. This is in defense of the brains of our children and young adults. And is the money that might be lost by the stores more important than the health of our young adults? I'm asking you to please not put money above health. Nashua can be an example, as Keene and Dover have done, to send a message to the state that this should be done statewide. I want to just show you something. Have a little show and tell. <clears throat> as many of you know, I taught health education in the high schools for a, quite a long time. And in my connections with people at the high school still, these are all of the devices that have been confiscated at Nashua High School North and Nashua High School South since the beginning of the school year. And the majority of them are the jewels. I will say that it, that is, I mean, there's one bag here that's all jewel stuff. Thank you very much for your time. As you can see, I'm very passionate about protecting our youth, and hopefully this important ordinance that Alderman Jetty is proposing will pass. And if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to connect, contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Just come forward. Dottie. Please give your name and address, please. Uh, Dottie Odin, 16 Cathedral Circle. And just for uh, clarifying, I am a member of the Board of Education here in Nashua. I'm here tonight to support Resolution 019-19. Dash 37, raising the age to purchase, use, uh, possess, and tobacco products and e-cigarettes from age 18 to 21. Uh, I want to thank Alderman Jetty and uh, Alderman Lopez for this ordinance. We have a serious problem, vaping problem, at our two high schools, as just about every other high school in the country is dealing with. Within the past few years, we had reduced the number of smoking offenses to only a handful of students. Unfortunately, things have changed. Now we have students who have never smoked a cigarette but are vaping throughout the day. Our schools are being overwhelmed by the growing number of students vaping. We also have a smaller number of students vaping at our middle schools, but if the national trend continues, that number will grow also. The Juul brand is the most popular vaping device in liquid. It is used by over 80% of those who vape and has grown into a $15 billion company in just over two years. I understand Juul took out a full-page advertisement in support of an ordinance similar to what Alderman Jetty has. They also advertise frequently frequently on Boston's WBZ radio station. They always ed end the ad with this statement. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Research tells us that the brain is not fully developed until the age of around 25. Because the brain is not fully developed, our students, in our students, the damage done by nicotine is more harmful to them. It takes a shorter time vaping for nicotine to alter their brain than it does for an adult. It is believed that an altered brain development could make them more susceptible to having addiction problems throughout their life. Our administrators and teachers are spending much time and effort on controlling the vaping issue. 
Our health teachers have incorporated the dangers of vaping into their curriculum, but sadly, peer pressure and the allure of vaping are strong and difficult to combat. Unfortunately, many parents do not understand or are unaware of the dangers and lifelong damage that vaping can cause their children. The sweet smell of some of the flavored juices that contain nicotine are appealing and give the impression that it's only a container of flavoring and not like a cigarette that contains nicotine, which we know is not true. Our schools need help and they need it now. I am asking for your help. We have a great many needs in educating our students which are not being met due to budget constraints. I ask you support this ordinance as there is no money involved, only your vote. It will not er eradicate the problem, but will send a strong message that vaping is harmful for our young people. It might also free up more time for our administrators and teachers to ensure our schools are safe and students' needs are being met. We need help in many areas, and this is one of them. Again, I am not asking for money only for your vote to support a strong message that this community is supportive of doing what is right and best for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie. Next. Don't be shy. Just come to the front. Lori Ortolano, 41 Berkeley Street. I don't know if you're going to take up the position for the director for um, the assessing office. I don't have an agenda, so I don't even know if that's on there. Yes, it is. It is on there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to convey um, a few concerns I might have in that area. It's very difficult for me to think that we can run the assessing office without management down in the office and that that's not the first area we're focusing on to um, stabilize what's been a difficult situation down there. Um, I'm a little bit concerned after the meeting a month ago that the mayor talked to some of us and mentioned that hiring um, a chief is very difficult. There are positions that are very hard to fill and get. If, if that's the case, it makes me wonder whether the whole um, focus of the technical part of assessing should be an outsourced job um, for the city. I know most cities don't do that. I know many towns in New Hampshire do do that, and I don't know if you will spend any time discussing the differences or the possibility of outsourcing the technical part, the running of the model, the um, uh, creation of the cards, the inputting of the permits, the MLS verification, if that could be handled as an outsourced piece with the clerical work supported internally by staff in Nashua. But I've focused and moved toward that opinion in the last month uh, because I see so many obstacles down there in, in staffing and getting the right resources to do the quality of work that we want to have with our cards and our data system. So, and I'm concerned, I don't know if the mayor brought the directorship forward with possibly in mind the idea of outsourcing the work down in the assessing office and that just hasn't been shared publicly. Maybe that is his intention, I don't know. But it just seems to me like that might be a direction we should, we should look at. Um, you know, I just wanted to share that with you as a concern. Thank you. Thank you. Next, go ahead, step up. Um, my name is Maniac Graves. I'm a resident of 23 Sorota Ave, Nashville, New Hampshire. Thank you to the Honorable Board of Aldermen and to my fellow Nashua residents for sacrificing your evening for this important cause. As you all know, we are gathered here today to support Alderman Ernest Jetty's proposed ordinance to raise the A's from 18 to 21 to purchase and possess tobacco products in Nashua. Truthfully, however, we are all here for one basic reason, and that reason is that we all want to do what is best for the youth of our city. 
My name is Vinayak Grave, and I've been living in the beautiful city of Nashville for 11 years. I'm currently a high school freshman, and I have been attending an online accredited academy for the last four years. I'm honored to be here today, and I'm proud to express my strong support for Alderman Jetty's proposal. I would like to begin with a quote by Franklin D. Roosevelt, which states, we cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. Today, right now, each one of us has a chance to build our youth for a future of happiness and health. The difference that we make today is a difference that could save lives. Two years ago, my elder sibling entered high school a bright and enthusiastic student. Slowly, he transitioned from, I only tried it once, to it helps relax me, to finally he had developed an addiction to vaping. Now, due to the effects of his vaping, his mental health has suffered greatly, and he is no longer able to attend the local high school. Numerous times he told me, you can get anything you want at high school. Raising the age from 18 to 21 for the purchase and possession of tobacco products could prevent brilliant students like my brother from going down the dark road of addiction. It would prevent 18-year-old high school students from buying and distributing harmful tobacco products to younger students. As my brother stated, you can get anything at the local high school as long as you're willing to pay the price. Since the late 1950s, tobacco products have purposely advertised to children, explaining that it was vital to the survival of their industry. Back in the mid-1970s, Claude Teague, assistant chief in R&D at R.J. Reynolds, stated in a paper, if our company is to survive and prosper, over the long term, we must get our share of the youth market. Thus, we need to brand designs to be particularly attractive to the young smoker, while ideally at the same time appealing to all smokers. It is in that statement alone that the tobacco industry's true motive becomes apparent. They don't care about the health of our youth. As long as they're making billions of dollars each year, they are willing to quite literally sacrifice lives. According to the American Lung Association, every day roughly 2,500 children under the age of 18 will try their first cigarette. 400 of them will transition to becoming regular day smokers, and half of them will eventually die from their habit. If this pattern continues and we fail to put precautions in place, an estimated 5.6 million of today's youth will ultimately die prematurely from smoking-related diseases. Today, smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. Smoking damages both your heart and circulation, increasing conditions such as coronary heart disease, heart attack, peripheral vascular disease, and cerebrovascular disease. If you smoke, you are 50% more likely to have a stroke, which can lead to permanent brain damage or even death. If smoking causes 84% of deaths from lung cancer and 83% of deaths from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Furthermore, smoking causes at least 15 different types of cancers. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services stated that roughly 90% of adult smokers began smoking during their teenage years. A study in 2014 showed that 62% of current smokers in both middle and high school attempted to quit but were unable to do so. It has been proven that people who begin smoking at an earlier age are more likely to develop a severe addiction to nicotine than those who start later in life. Though conventional cigarette smoking has declined over the past few decades, there has been a substantial increase in the use of electronic cigarettes or electronic nicotine delivery systems. E-cigarettes are devices that electronically deliver nicotine without combustion through a process called vaping. When they were first imported into the U.S. around 2007, the smoking industry claimed that e-cigarettes were developed as smoking cessation tools. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 20.8% of high school students reporting using e-cigarettes and 4.9% of middle school students reported the same, making e-cigarettes the most popular method of tobacco use for youth in the United States. Unlike traditional cigarettes, e-cigarette marketing is not restricted. Thus, they are being advertised on television, in magazines, at concert events and music festivals and sporting events, and kids are noticing. Since the kickoff of the e-cigarette market in the U.S., the tobacco industry has bought out several e-cigarette brands, promoting them as safer alternatives to smoking and introducing appealing flavors to attract youth. Honestly, we don't know the long-term 
effects of vaping, but a study conducted by the University of California, San Francisco, Center for Tobacco Control Research and Education, linked adolescents' use of e-cigarettes to higher odds of progressing from experimental to established use of combustible cigarettes. So what might I ask happen to the tobacco industry's claims that e-cigarettes would help quit smoking? I would like you to all to remember that the city of Nashua is, has the second biggest population in New Hampshire with roughly 88,000 residents. Is it not our duty to set an example as a major city in New Hampshire? Today we have a chance to set the bar high and join other communities like Dover, Keene, and Newmarket who have already made changes with regards to smoking. If the second biggest city in New Hampshire can raise the age from 18 to 21 to purchase, use, and possess tobacco products, who's stopping the rest of the state from following? It isn't just what we do for our city that counts. It's the example that we set for other cities that truly matter. The opportunity we have for our city today is a step towards making all of New Hampshire a better state for our youth. If we can save even one life from passing this bill, is it not worth it? <clears throat> I'm not, here standing, I'm not standing here today to throw statistics at you. I'm here today because we have a chance to save lives, and there is nothing more important than the health and the future of our youth. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Next. Come on up. My name is Advika Runkumar. I'm a resident of 19 Preserve Drive in Londonderry. Uh, you may ask why I'm speaking at the to the Board of Aldermen when I'm from London Dairy. As you all know, Nashville has been and still is a major city in New Hampshire. If this ordinance is passed in the city of Nashua, I predict that there would be a domino effect in nearby suburbs and maybe even spread northwards throughout New Hampshire. If Nashua sets the precedent of increasing the age when one is permitted to purchase tobacco products, I feel we, as the state of New Hampshire, can save the lives of so many teens and adolescents plagued by this problem. This ordinance could provide momentum for a state bill for the increase in the legal age of tobacco use. Before I begin, I would like to share a small anecdote relating to this issue that I experienced in my freshman year of high school. In Londonderry, all high school freshmen are required to be enrolled in and complete a freshman science course. One day in that class, we took a short hike to a pond on our campus in order to conduct an experiment relating to ecology. While at the pond, a group of students brought out an e-cigarette inserted a nicotine pod, and started to vape with the e-cigarette. I was absolutely shocked to see some peers putting toxic and addictive substances into their bodies. These are the very people I had known and who they lost an innocent part of themselves at the young age of 15. I then decided to ask them why they had started using the tobacco products, just out of genuine interest and concern. They replied with, I just like the way it makes me feel, and everyone else is doing it. Besides, it's not as harmful as other smoking cigarettes. I expected to hear the first reply, but the second one completely shocked me. I was taken aback when I heard that my own peers had the notion that e-cigarettes or menthol cigarettes were much less harmful than cigarettes. Though e-cigarettes are marketed by the tobacco industry as less harmful and addictive than e-cigarettes, that is not the whole story. Just like regular cigarettes, e-cigarettes also contain nicotine. Nicotine is proven to be one of the, if not the, most addictive of drugs available, either legally or illegally. It's compared to, nic it's compared to cocaine and heroin. I would just like to take a moment to ex explain the neurobiology behind the effects of nicotine, as that can truly show how harmful nicotine can be for those whose centers of cognition, planning, and decision making are still developing. Nicotine is a substance which easily enters the bloodstream, no matter the method of, sorry, method of ingestion, smoking, chewing, sniffing, or et cetera, nicotine affects the relationship between a neurotransmitter by the name of acetylcholine and its receptors in neurons. Acetylcholine is responsible for maintaining heart rate, breathing, memory, and muscle movement. So one can imagine how detrimental damage to the system can be. Nicotine has a molecular structure similar to acetylcholine, so it can take the place of acetylcholine in its receptors. Repeated use of tobacco products leads to the neurons to think that there is an excess of acetylcholine, which causes the number of acetylcholine receptors to decrease. This decrease in receptors is what leads to addiction to nicotine. Withdrawal from nicotine can cause issues such as tremors, trouble sleeping, increased appetite, irritability, and lack of alertness. 
All of these issues can be harmful for students in school and at home, causing them to have a lower quality of life. Additionally, nicotine activates the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which allows the user of the drug to associate smoking with a sense of pleasure. This causes them to continue using the drug and develop a strong addiction to it. With the knowledge of the neuroscience behind the manner in which one can be addicted to nicotine, I feel that it is completely logical to say that the level of addiction would increase with longer use. If teens start using nicotine, a drug that has a degree of addictiveness comparable to illegal drugs such as cocaine and heroin, imagine the outcomes they would face on later in life. I would like to leave you with a quote from the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Benjamin Disraeli. The youth of a nation are the trustees of posterity. In order to remain true to this maxim and keep the future of our youth in good hands, the ordinance to increase the legal age of tobacco product purchase must be passed. If we have the chance to save the health of our youth and start a ripple of change throughout the nation, I think we should take it. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you. Okay, next, please come forward. Good evening, my name is Susan Haas. I live at 18 Waters Edge Drive, Nashua, and I am in Ward 2. I'm a passionate community activist for drug and alcohol prevention. I'm an activate, uh, advocate for youth-based leadership training and activities that invest our youth in their community and then further on in life. I have spent 35 years working with youth at all levels and in many situations. Youth need to know that we care, that we will mentor them, and that we will make an investment in their lives. When we entice our youth with bubble gum or sweet cherry flavored e-cigarettes, what do you think will happen? More likely than not, Addiction. Bubble gum leads to nicotine. Nicotine leads to whatever their next addiction of choice may be, and off we go again. Who are we kidding? If middle school students can vape in school bathrooms, we are opening pathways that began a half a century ago with warnings on cigarette packages. It's like we're backpedaling. Some states are contemplating the ban, total ban on flavored e-cigarettes, along with other flavored tobacco products. Supporters are aiming to make e-cigarettes less alluring to our adolescents. The National Youth Tobacco Survey found that youth vaping surged 78% between 2017 and 2018. Health officials have said that teen vaping is of great concern because the nicotine in adolescents can disrupt the brain circuits, as others have spoken about, that control attention, learning, and can lead to increased impulsivity and other mood disorders. And finally, studies are showing that middle and high school students are becoming addicted at very high rates to nicotine caused through vaping. We must raise the age of purchase to 21 for vaping purchases and absolutely remove sweet flavored e-cigarettes from being purchased by anyone under the age of 21. I am first a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, and that I am committed to help our young people stay straight, sober, and enjoy life drug-free. I beseech you to vote on behalf of our youth, on behalf of your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews. Please raise the age of e-cigarettes to 21. Thank you.
Thank you, Susan. Okay, who's next? Don't be shy. Oh, I'm taller. Hold on. There it is. Hi, everybody. I'm Heather Raymond. I live at 19 Dunbarton Drive. Um, as many of you know, I am the current president of the National Board of Education. Um, I'm also a mom. I have an almost 11-year-old um, and an almost 9-year-old at home. And both of them have friends with older siblings who are vaping. Um, both of them have seen it. Um, and I had to have a conversation with both of my children about the fact that e-cigarettes are not candy that they are in fact the same as cigarettes and that they will damage their lungs. And they were surprised to hear this because our youth does not understand that the vapor in e-cigarettes is not harmless. And I'm not gonna go through the statistics and all of the medical stuff because we had some really wonderful youth here who explained it much better than I could. Um, I came prepared with a bunch of statistics, um, but people have already said all of them at this point. Um, to me, I think the biggest, um, Thing that I want everyone to think about today is the fact that um, in our schools right now, we have youth who are vaping every day. Um, our um, code of conduct says that if you get caught with an e-cigarette, it's just like getting caught with a regular cigarette and it's a suspension. Um, and I am very concerned about the effect of our discipline and getting caught with these things on some of these kids who don't understand why we have these rules. They don't understand that what they're doing can damage themselves. Um, it's also really hard on our teachers. I mean, kids are blowing it down their shirt. They're hiding it in the bathroom. Some of them don't have an odor, um, especially if you're using a jewel to use marijuana. Um, that doesn't smell. It's not like when, you know, I was a kid and things smelled strongly. You know, you could always tell if someone was smoking in the bathroom. Um, but now there's no way for our teachers to know um, unless a child is careless. Um, I really strongly feel that if we raise the age, it will keep teenagers from purchasing and sharing with their friends and then their friends' younger siblings. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Okay, who's next? Come on up. Hello, my name is David Garofalo, 15 Spitbrook Road in Nashua, New Hampshire. I was here last month at the meeting. I heard a lot of misconceptions, um, so I actually went to work to try to gather as much information as I can uh, to set the record straight, um, even hearing some misconceptions today. But this bill is on raising the smoking age, and what I heard is a lot about vape. And um, I'm not in the vape business, I'm in the cigar business, but this is about all tobacco products and um, how they're going to affect the people into, into this city that uh, have put everything they had into this. I own Two Guys Smoke Shop in Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, I opened up about 12 years ago, and uh, I became the highest volume cigar retailer in the world, and of all places operating here in Nashua, New Hampshire. And you have a couple of the biggest cigar retailers in the world operating out of this city, and what this bill says is, um, from what I'm hearing, we have a problem with vape, so let's just put, corral everybody together and say all tobacco products. So I have some data here with me, and, and in my hand right here is 521 pages of recent information. I'm not going back to the 1970s like I'm hearing some of these things talking about, but this is information, up-to-date information data that has been received from government-funded and government-led studies that prove premium cigars are a unique product category and almost exclusively enjoyed by older adults infrequently. Um, they do not have an age problem. And some of the age problem that we're hearing with vape that people are mentioning are the problems of 15-year-olds. Well, there's 15-year-old people, there's a law that says 18 is, um, is the law, and obviously they can't control the 18-year-old. I don't know how we're going to control a 20-year-old when, when the age becomes 21. May I put this down? Yes, please. In these studies, 521 pages, and again, this is not from me, a 34-year-old cigar retailer, 34 years in the business, I've sold millions of cigars, um, 
and I didn't do these studies. Uh, it was done by PATH, that's the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health, it was also in there as the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, also the NLM, National Longitude Morality Studies, and it has been covered and published in the Journal of American Medicine. These studies are over 350,000 Americans, and they covered them in right up to date over three decades. The average age of a cigar smoker is 30 years old. The average amount consumed is one cigar every 30 days. 97% of cigar smokers do not consume daily, and that's because it is a non-addictive product. It is between 1% and 3% nicotine when a tomato is 5%, eggplant is 9%, and many, many foods have nicotine in them. Nicotine is not the most addictive product there is. It's caffeine. And unless we're going to end up stopping every coffee shop consuming uh, coffee or every soda company that uses caffeine, that is the most consumed addictive product that there is, not nicotine. Nicotine's in a lot of foods that we eat. There is no significant risk in smoking-related diseases found between premium cigars and not in a non-smoker. And let me say that again. No significant risk in smoking-related diseases found between premium cigar smokers and non-smokers. This is what their study says. Cigars are different and should never be included in these other products, these electronic products that are chemical-based products. There was a problem with tobacco, and now the problem is chemical-based products. Uh, but back to the case in hand, raising the age from 18 to 21 in Nashua only, um, the state of New Hampshire decided not to raise the state tax. And uh, here's some reasons why they decided not to do that. Um, you can make the decision to get married here in New Hampshire at age 16. You can make the decision to get divorced in the state at age 16. You can operate a motor vehicle at 16. Some people want to even change the voting age to 16 because they feel that a 16-year-old can make proper decisions. But right now it's 18. At 18, they can vote. They can also get a credit card, join the military without consent, serve on a jury, and choose the fate of another person. At 18, they can change their name if they want. They can donate blood and become an organ donor. They can gamble, play the lottery in the state, and at 18, they can adopt a child. You can adopt a child at age 18, but you're saying a 20-year-old cannot choose whether to buy a cigar or not at the age of 20. There are some 20-year-olds uh, that should not be making decisions, but who, who are we to choose? Who is a city to choose who and, and what can make those decisions? Certainly, it shouldn't be a city that would make that decision. I know a 20-year-old Air Force pilot, his name is John McGuire, and I see him once a year when he comes in the store, comes in to buy a cigar. I tried to get him here to be with me. He's already served a three-year tour in the military. He's married and has a child. I wanted him to be here so he could tell his story. His brain is not fully developed. I think he would uh, argue that uh, decision with you. And when he comes back from a tour, can he come into our store in Nashville, New Hampshire anymore to buy a cigar? That's going to be your decision to make. Um, this is a border town. Uh, many struggling brick and mortars cannot afford to lose any customers, even a few 20-year-olds like we may have in our cigar shop, uh, and like John, the military pilot. Uh, this commitment is overstepping, I feel, for any city to make this decision. It's an abuse of power, and I ask you, please, do not make this decision. And I, my heart goes out to any, any child that uh, chooses to take on smoking, and, and certainly nobody wants that. Um, maybe there's a parental problem here where a 15-year-old is going inside there, but a 20-year-old deciding to have a cigar once or twice a year should not be an issue, and we are... I am crammed in with this and cer certainly uh, choose not to lose any customers at all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Come forward, please. Hi, my name is Albie Bunditz. I live at 27 Wheaton Drive, Ward 1, Nashville for the last 40 years or so. 
and I'm not going to repeat what others have said or what I said uh, a month ago. <laughs> I do want to address some of the things, however. Actually, first, what I want to say thank you to all of you guys who are elected in here evenings running our city for a second job after your day job. And the second thing I want to say, and that's not just you guys, it's, it's the, I have more time now, so I've been up at the state legislature as well, and all of you do an amazing job. I could not do it. I also want to thank these kids who, stop, who talked tonight. I think I, what I am doing now besides talking to legislator types is I teach at Dartmouth Medical School and at University of New England Medical School. And we are going to be in good hands. So I think we actually have a lot to be optimistic about, especially when you hear stuff like this from freshmen in high school. Um, it could be a freshman in medical school. <laughs> um, anyway, l let me just say, uh, first of all, that nicotine is addictive. Uh, all nicotine that we get from uh, th that's commercially available is made from tobacco products. I'm sorry, sir. Can you speak oh, I'm sorry. Tonight, okay, hard. nicotine is addictive. Uh, nicotine that are commercial products, including cigars, come from tobacco. So it is a tobacco product. It is. It affects the susceptible developing brain more than any other substance, and leads to a, a lifetime of an indelible memory that's left. And I won't go into the acetylcholine receptors and all that because you already heard about that, and she's totally correct on it. Um, but those receptors, those the, the triggers for those receptors never go away, and we've known, and I'm using old data because there's also new data that, that confirms all of this, from Stanford, from Mayo Clinic, uh, from University of Wisconsin. I have pages of references that I can, I'm happy to supply you uh, that leads to other substances, specifically opioids and alcohol. We don't know necessarily about cannabis or not. So my thrust is that for the developing brain should not be exposed to nicotine. Um, you know, for the 30-year-old who wants a cigar once a year, fine. But if you look at the Surgeon General report from the mid-1980s, a premium cigar, uh, Havana cigar, maybe I shouldn't say Havana, but th they carry a tremendous amount of nicotine. Second, and Dr. Rosenblum said this well last time, ingesting it as opposed to heating it and inhaling the nicotine affects the brain totally differently. Uh, and I won't go into the, uh, the amounts, but it's something like 22 kilos of eggplant you would need to get uh, ingest to get the same amount of nicotine in the brain as one cigarette. So um, that, the data is clear. I think the main thing is we don't want our kids, and I think we agree on that actually, uh, uh, addicted to nicotine and to start that and then to be open to other uh, addictions. And again, I think I said this last time, but if I didn't, I'm going to say it again anyway. Not to diss the opioid crisis, it is a crisis. 480 people died in New Hampshire last year of that, but 1,900 people died of tobacco-related disease. Now, you don't die at a young age, like 25 or 30. You die at an old age, but much younger than myself, in the 40s, 50s, or 60s. <laughs> and uh, that's premature death. And uh, it, and tobacco-related disease leads to that, still causing 1,900 deaths in this state, 480,000 deaths in our country. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Please come forward. How you doing? I'm Eric Kilbane. I'm in Castro's back room down here on Main Street at 119. Uh, I've been open since 1996, and I just feel like this is a situation where we're in a collective type of punishment here. We're pulling the cigars into, all I've heard about is, is vape, which uh, I don't sell any vape. I don't really know a whole lot about vape. Uh, I'm sure kids are doing it in school. I saw the bag of stuff there. But that's not what we should be involved in, in getting that pulled into that realm there. That's not what it is. It's a, it's a separate thing altogether and we shouldn't be involved in it. I don't know how the police are gonna enforce it when they go to the next town over, they buy a vape or whatever legally. Are they supposed to pull them over or w what's gonna happen there? You know, they, it's legal. The federal government's not gonna do stings. Who's gonna do the stings on this stuff? The city of Nashua, who's gonna pay for the stings? What's gonna happen with the master tobacco settlement? It's going to go down. The state will get less money from the tobacco companies. 
And who's going to pick that up? The taxpayers are going to pay all that money that the state is not receiving any longer? I don't know. It just the age thing is, uh, I mean, I know kids 15 years old shouldn't be smoking bait. That's, that's good. But a nice premium cigar when you're 18. A lot of people come in when they're 18. They come in on Father's Day. They come in on Christmas. They come in on Fourth of July. They might buy a cigar or two. And as far as the federal government's concerned, that's that's the legal age. So that's all I that's all I'd like to say about that. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Michael Watt, 5 Briarcliff Drive, Nashville, New Hampshire. Don't worry, I only have one paragraph. Um, <laughs> hello? <laughs> I spoke on this issue uh, last time, and if you remember, I used the word win-win situation. Um, just like what I'm hearing from a lot of people, it sounds like uh, I keep hearing about the liquid tobacco and devices. Is there any wiggle room to make that be am amended to just be that? It sounds like there's a whole bag full of those, but is there bags of cigarettes too? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Can I just ask the question? Are people allowed to speak more than once? Why did you? Do you have five more pages? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine if you'd like to get up and speak once more. Thank you. You're welcome. You still need to give your name and address, please. Mike Graves, 23 Soda Ave. Thank Nashville, you. New Hampshire. I just want to say really quickly, once again, this is not, this is either a choice between money or the health of our youth. As I stated in my report, that 90% of current adult smokers say that they start smoking as teenagers. So not only would this save our youth, but this would also help the adults who are smoking and helping their diseases as it would help not to prevent them from smoking. Because as we said in my report that 9% are start smoking as teenagers. So this, uh, this ordinance would stop teenagers from buying and also stop them possibly from growing up with health issues as they grow older. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, last call for public comment. Madam Chair. I know Chief Lavoy uh, came at, at uh, our or your invitation, and I don't know if uh, if you want to wait. I, I'd rather wait until do that in conversation. Okay. I'd rather wait till the ordinance comes up, if you don't mind. Fine. Thank no. you. So, okay. So public comment is over, and we will start with um, interviews. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. Okay, we have uh, Sandra Pratt and for the Cultural Connection. If you would come step forward and s oh, the mayor's here. Okay. Hello, how are you? It's amazingly suspicious timing. <laughs> Watch you come upstairs again. Thank you, Mayor. Say my name when I leave. No, we're going to let the mayor uh, introduce you, if that's okay. Very nice. All right. Thank you, um, Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is Sandra Pratt, who I'm appointing to the Cultural Affairs Committee. Um, she can explain her, her background to you, but she's multilingual. Uh, she's been very involved in, or trilingual. Sandra is trilingual. Um, she's been a special ed teacher. She's been an ESL teacher. Uh, and in the city here, she's very involved in uh, reaching out to some of our uh, different ethnic communities and trying to involve them in the city. Uh, so she is like a perfect appointment for the Cultural Connections Committee. And uh, so I'm very pleased to recommend her and uh, appoint her for your consideration tonight. Thank you. Okay, Sandra, would you like to give us a little feedback as to why you'd like to join? The cultural connection. Um, like the mayor already um, say, I do a lot of work for the community, and um, this is more like a formal part. But I should be able to vote and do other things. But I am part of One Great in Ashwa. Um, as a navigator, I work uh, close with immigrants and refugees. I am part also of the Latino Council. 
And that's what I work closely with individuals that are newer to the community, so they don't know a lot of English. So it's more like in Portuguese or in Spanish. Um, I also start reading at the library um, to little kids to just reinforce, you know, they're sometimes they're, you know, embarrassed little kids to, to say that they speak Portuguese or Spanish. So I am um, reading every first Thursday at the library for the little kids in Portuguese and Spanish. It's another way to, you know, reinforce the value of um, other cultures. And I have been trying this for many years, get books since my kids were little. My younger son is eight years old now, and my older son is 14 years old. So it's great that, you know, I didn't have the opportunity to read to them when they were little kids, but I am an early childhood educator um, from the heart, you know, from the background. <laughs> so uh, that's, that would be great when they were younger, but that was not the case, not the opportunity. But I'm glad to do that right now. And um, I'm not working as an early childhood educator right now, but I work for Gateways Community Services. I'm a trilingual service coordinator there. I'm very happy because it's a kind of job that I serve my community, and that's the, what I like to do and enjoy the most, is to serve my community. So if you all have questions, I, I didn't prepare for this. I didn't know what to expect, so I'm sorry. Um, but I'm here to answer any question. You did fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so anyone from the committee have any questions? Alderman Clement. Thank you. I, I just want to uh, say thank you for coming forward and for uh, volunteering your time uh, to the um, Cultural Connections Committee. Um, I'm reading your resume, and I am very impressed. Uh, I think you have um, you, you have the perfect amount of experience um, that somebody would want on that committee. So uh, again, thank you for your time and for stepping forward for that. Thank you, I appreciate it. Anyone else? All the women, Kelly. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to comment uh, that I appreciate you stepping forward as well. I think I've seen the work of the navigators and I'm, I'm personally so very proud of the immigrant population and, and the diversity that I get to live in, my daughter gets to live in, and I know that you'll be a great asset to the committee. So thank you for stepping forward. Thank you. Alderman Lopez. Uh, yeah, I am familiar with Sandra, um, with her work at the Adult Learning Center, with the work with the One Greater Nashua Cultural Navigators. Um, I was just curious um, if you have any opinions on um, immigration ceremonies here in Nashua. I know at one point I was trying to get one at the 4th of July celebration so that people could do they could swear their oath of citizenship in front of their friends and families instead of having to be shuttled off to Portsmouth and hitch a ride back and all that kind of stuff. I think that's a great idea, and I think would be like the option of the, the citizen because the person, because some of them would like to step up to go to Concord. And I think they do have the option to do like right at the office, which we had like a meeting last week with one of the officers from the immigration from, I think... If I'm not wrong, Manchester. Um, so it is an option, and I, but I think we should, um, uh, you know, um, say their names, and uh, I, 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 I don't know the word right now. I'm just a little welcome bit nervous them. to be here. <laughs> not really welcome them, but uh, um, well, anyway, to have a list of the names of the, you know, all the citizens that became. You, you know, you, citizens from the United States recognize, that's the word, recognize them and and talk about them. And, you know, I think that would be nice at our multicultural um, festival or any other occasion would be great. Um, but it's it's more up to the person, I guess, to go up to Concord or not or to be more formal or not. Thanks for the answer. You did a great job. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, thank you, Sandra, for staying, because I know you're upstairs in the Citizens Academy. Yes. Uh, we will vote on you later on, and then you would come to the next board meeting to get sworn in. Okay. If you're approved. Okay. So you don't have to wait until the end right. of the we meeting. Okay. So thank you. Go back to the academy. You can go back to your academy. <laughs> thank you very Mayor, much. Mayor, is uh, Lisa Hardy here? I don't think Lisa is here. She's, I nominated her to the uh, Mind Falls Advisory Committee, but I don't think she's here for you to interview. Okay, so then we'll postpone um, Lisa's 
for nomination the, until okay. our May meeting. If that's okay with everyone. Um, now, Madam Chair. Yes. I am also here on um, uh, 01940, mm -hmm. but I'm also trying to uh, attend the Citizen Academy upstairs as much as I can. Sure. So I would. If you wouldn't mind, I would leave and then come back yep, for that discussion. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, It'll great. be a while. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, communications. Mr. Clerk. Okay. Um, there being no object objection, I would uh, accept the communication from Andrew Lavoy, Chief of Police, regarding Resolution R19120. Okay. And I place that on file. Okay. Very good. And should, you have. Should we go through all of them? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, there being no objection, I would accept the communication and place it on file from Tim Cummings, Director of Economic Development, regarding communication providing additional details as requested on Ordinance 18030. Um, and I believe those are the only two. Okay, fine. Thank you. All right. Application to license hawkers, peddlers, vendors license. There is none. Okay. Appointments by the mayor. Alderman Clemens. Thank you. I would move to recommend the confirmation of Sandra Pratt, 24 Jingris Drive, Nashua, to the Cultural Connections Committee for a term to expire March 1st, 2022. Oh. Okay. Okay. So you heard the motion uh, to nominate Sandra Pratt to the Cultural Connection. Uh, do we have any concerns? Questions? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Okay. That motion uh, passes. Okay. And we will hold uh, Lisa. <coughs> Lisa. What was her name? Lisa Hardy. Oh, yeah, Lisa Hardy to our May uh, meeting. Thank you. Unfinished business resolution. Alderman Clemens. Yes, uh, resolution uh, 18073, proposing an amendment to the city charter relative to filling vacancies on elected boards by majority vote of the remaining members. Uh, I would move to amend R18073 in its entirety by replacing it with the proposed amendments placed on our desk this evening. Okay. You heard the motion. Do we have any discussion? Alderman Clemens. Thank you. So um, the amendment that was uh, placed on the on your desk tonight and we got in our packets on Friday um, basically brings the this proposal back to the way we used to fill vacancies prior to uh, 2006. Um, so in short, what that does is essentially allows the Board of Aldermen to, or any board in the city, um, to fill a vacancy by electing a person amongst um, for example, the Board of Aldermen amongst uh, the members remaining um, and have that person fill out the term uh, until the next regularly scheduled municipal election. So what that effectively does is make sure that no one's ever being appointed um, for more than a two-year period, and in most cases it would be less than that. Um, so that way, um, you know, I think it, it, it balances the compromise of, we want to make sure that, you know, the people's voices are being heard in the sense that we want to give them the democratic vote of electing their representative. But on the other hand, it fills the expediency of, we need them to be represented in the meantime, uh, without incurring a 30,000 dollar per election cost. So I think it balances that. Nothing in this prevents the person who is appointed from running for uh, office uh, at that next election um, 
and I think, you know, I think we've, we tried the experiment of the special elections originally um, back in 2006. I actually came before the Board of Aldermen here and spoke in favor of that. Um, but I think, you know, as time's gone on, the costs of elections uh, have increased a lot. And I think the, um, it's not always the most effective or best way to, to fill a vacancy. And, um, you know, I think we're better served by waiting um, until we have an election scheduled to add that position to the ballot and then fill the vacancy from there. Um, so that's what this uh, amendment would do. Alderman Kelly. Thank you. Um, forgive me if this is the wrong way of addressing this. I know there's a motion on the floor. I would like to table it. I feel like we got quite a bit of revisions even just today. And I don't feel like I've had the time to look at this. This is a really important issue and I want to read through it all and have some discussions before I need to vote on it. Okay. Um, I think that this is a time sensitive. Uh, either Council Bolton, could you answer that or is, I think Trish is. Well, we don't have unlimited time. Right. I, I don't know that if tabling it for a month is going to prevent us from being able to get it on the ballot, but we're not going to be able to expend a lot more time if that is mm -hmm. done. And there may be other things that cause delay down the road. This is still has to be submitted to the uh, state attorney general, commissioner of the Department of Revenue Administration, and the secretary of state for their review. So. But I don't want to hurry anybody. If you need <laughs> right. to table it, you need to table it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Spahn, I, I'm, I'm with you. I understand that. I don't want to belabor things either, but I also feel like the, the ordinance has changed quite drastically in the last week, and even today. Maybe it hasn't, but it, it looks has like it had, has. <laughs> it has and, had a number of iterations as I've either made mistakes in writing it or I've uh, had other things pointed out to me that I hadn't considered. Uh, so I think the intention has remained the same, but we tried to bring more clarity to it. I feel less clear, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Alderman Lopez, did you have your hand up? Yes. Use first and then Alderman Lopez. Um, I was going to say that my recollection was that the city clerk uh, said that we really need to have this um, voted on by the full board in whatever form by June in order to get it to the state in time for it to be to November. That's my recollection. So. City clerk is probably writing this down right now, and will correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I, I believe that we should be very, very careful with this. Um, I didn't necessarily have a problem with the original iteration of it. Um, so I would say, I would suggest that the, the biggest hang up in this entire process with respect to um, the scheduling of the board and uh, of this committee and the, is this committee. It only meets once a month. So um, if it's possible to maybe refer it back to the Board of Aldermen with this amendment along with it rather than just tabling it again. We don't have to embed the delay. We could just take this up with the full board and everyone can sit down and like commit to reading ahead of time, talking it out when we actually have the board. Like Typically, we try to do the working committees, but I, I would say I agree with Alderman Kelly's concerns and uh, Attorney Bolton's observation that there have been several recent reiterations. The public should have a chance to look at it, so... I'm not sure that we should immediately send it back to the board with a recommendation if we, even our fellow aldermen, haven't seen this going on. If it's going to end up there anyway, why not just re-refer it to the board and try to figure it out there? Okay. Before I call on you, Alderman Laws, um, Ms. Piazza, could you come forward and uh, maybe kind of give us a schedule between mm -hmm. you and Counselor? <clears throat> just to make sure before we... Thank you. Good evening. For the record, my name is Patricia Pietz from the City Clerk. So I had done up a timeline relative to the amendment and when it needs to go back to the board because you've got to remember the Board of Aldermen only meet once in the month of July and once in the month of August as well. So in looking at the final report, because they again, like Corporation Council said, once the board approves this, it's going to need to have another public hearing. 
So you have the seven days for that public hearing. And then when the board reports it out, they have within 10 days to file a report with me. And then I need to, I mean, seven days for that. Then I have 10 days to get it to the state. The state then has, within 14 days, has to acknowledge that they've received it. And then they have a 45-day window in which to get back to us as to whether or not there is any, um, whether it conflicts with any other state laws. And that's the three different state agency, as Corporation Council men mentioned. So in looking at the, if we look at the final report coming out at the June 25th Board of Aldermen meeting, that's going to put you into the month of August for that coming back to us. The June 25th meeting will be at the end of August. So either way, a special board meeting would have to be held. But if we go any later than the middle of June, if we push it to July, then we're really pushing it because we're now into the September election and you're really pushing it close as far as... Um, Tom, as far as the um, getting everything ready for the ballot and everything. Okay, so if I ask you, a qu if um, this committee met, let's say we had another meeting before our May meeting, um, would that be helpful to you? Like, say we had a meeting uh, in between the April um, Board of Aldermen meeting, would that help you? Would that help? It would, but again, it, I mean, as long as it's been, it gets reported out by June, sometime in June, we're all set. It depends on what this committee decides to do and the discussion held in the committee, so. Okay. Um, before I get back to you, I, Alderman Laws, I told him he could speak for Sorry. us. And then... Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Uh, first of all, I support what Alderman Lopez said. I, I think that it's... Since it's so time sensitive, I've got no problem with it going to the full board so we can discuss it. But, but I just had a question about, so let's pretend that we need to fill a vacancy. Seven people on the board want Ben Clemens. Seven people on the board want Fred Tebum. How do we nominate and how do we break that, that tie? Uh, Councilor? You keep voting till someone gets a majority. All right. Thank you. Okay. Alderwoman Kelly and then Alderman Kelly. Clements. If I could ask a question to the city clerk. The way you explained the process, we would have to have another public hearing after we vote? Is that what? I want to make sure I understood. If I'm not mistaken, because of the changes that are involved with this amendment, I think last time Corporation Council did suggest that we did have another public hearing on it. I think the, the changes are material enough that you should. Then it's clear. So to clarify, you're saying we wouldn't need that public hearing. I was just confused by having a public hearing after we've already made the vote. No, I said that the changes are material, material enough, enough. Okay. that we should have another public hearing to make it clear that we have complied with that requirement. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we have the public hearing before we took the vote? I mean, if people come and all say they're against it, we don't have another vote you scheduled. Take the pub you have the public hearing before the final vote and report to the city clerk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I misunderstood. I, I understood it the other way around. Okay. Thank okay. you. Alderman Clemens. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with, um, I don't have a problem, I guess, either way, either advancing this to the Board of Aldermen uh, as amended, you know, if we were to make this amendment tonight, um, or, um, if we were to have a special meeting of this committee sometime later this month, I would also support doing that, you know, probably before the second meeting so that we could get it out to the last meeting of the Board of Aldermen in April. Um, I wouldn't have any objection to that either. Um, but, you know, I, I do understand the time sensitivity of this and really, you know, there will be, I mean, I guess I get the, uh, you know, we don't want to, we want to look at this and, and know if this is something that we want to do. Um, but it's pretty straight. I, I know the language isn't straightforward, but it's, it's it, the way that it works is pretty straightforward. It's, it's, you know, it's sort of a compromise hybrid between the, the last iteration of this. Um, and the only, 
um, I guess, issue, if you will, or or anything would be a tie vote, uh, as Alderman Laws uh, has has brought up. Um, but maybe Councillor Bolton can enlighten us. Have you ever seen that happen in all of your time at the city when uh, there was a vacancy prior to the way that the charter reads now? A tie vote, you mean? Yeah. No, I've seen a situation where three people are nominated and on the first ballot, no one gets a majority. Typically, what you see happen is the person who was in third place bows out and either formally or people see the way the wind's blowing, and uh, then of the remaining two, someone gets a majority. What is more often the case. But... I would say in the last 30 years, we've had three, four, five, six, maybe seven of these situations before the charter got changed. So it, it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, but it's not unusual for, for it to come up every year or two. Alderman Lopez, and then Alderman Dowd. So if, I mean, so there's two things I kind of want to see happen. I want to see us, like, discuss it as a board and actually make some decisions on it. But I also want to make sure that we enact the public uh, meeting. So uh, this question is for Attorney Bolton. In order to do that, we actually do have to recommend it for final passage this meeting. Is that correct? Or is that something that well, can just be scheduled? Have time. We have until June to send it along. Um, I think this complies with the law, mm -hmm. but the legislature has a reason. They want us to send it to the AG, the Secretary of State, and the Commissioner of DRA. If one of them comes back and says, well, you have to change it, and you have to change it significantly, then we'll probably run into an inability to get something that would pass muster on the ballot because we wouldn't have enough time to go back up there for 45 days on on a further amended version. Uh, but right now, you've got time. My caution is you don't have unlimited time. Um, anyway, that, that's sort of what the issue is. We, we started working on this thing some time back, and a lot of time has gone by. Uh, there's been a desire to either ch change it or make it more uh, comprehensive and clear. And so we're still we're still analyzing how best to do that. I guess that's what you are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Time has gone by, and if, if uh, at some point it will become urgent, and at some point we may be uh, waiting for another two years if, uh, if we end up not getting it on the ballot for this year's municipal election. Alderman Lopez? So to, I mean, Alderman um, Kelly's point, we just received this. As all, uh, Attorney Bolton pointed out, it's been difficult to even get it written because of all the changes that are being in the last minute. And my experience with the state is if they have a maximum window, then that's their bottom. Like if they say they have to do it within 14 days, what they mean internally is they have to do it within 13 and a half. Like that's when you can expect them to move. So I just want to be um, conservative with our, with our time because we don't know if they're going to send it back or if um, other issues will come up. So um but I, I am inclined to table it based on what I'm hearing, just to give us a little bit more time to read it. Okay. Alderman Dowd. Uh, a couple things. One, I did get a chance to read all the iterations <laughs> um, and sent a couple notes back to Corporation Council, but um, I'm fully comfortable with the final version 
and most of the changes in these iterations were relatively minor, didn't change the context of the ultimate legislation. And I know that the way the legislation is written now is the way that has worked in the past. Um, I was elected from, by the Board of Education to fill one of their vacancies off of the zoning board. So um, I think it worked. I ended up being on a Board of Education for 10 years. So, um, and it really concerns me, you know, we say we have a lot of time. Anytime you send something to Concord, mm. you're in trouble. <laughs> and if we don't get it through the full board, if, it, if you have another meeting and there's another change and then you have to have another public hearing, I'd rather go to the full board, get it ironed out, make sure we're comfortable with it, and, and, um, uh, you know, get it on its way because I'm very, very concerned that if we don't do this expeditiously that we'll end up missing the window and going another two years and heaven knows how many special elections we might have. And uh, I, I, I think it's worthwhile to send it back to the full board. They refer to here, some of the changes were made. Uh, <laughs> legislation appears to be in uh, pretty good shape at this point. Um, you'd have time to review it before the full Board of Aldermen meeting, and, and then if there's any discussion, you can, we can bring it up at the full Board meeting. Hopefully there'd be no major changes, because if there is, you know, you go back to the public hearing, and every time you do that, your, your window is closing. Alderman Clements. Thank you. Yeah, I... I you know, as I'm listening to everybody discuss, um, it, it, I, I have every confidence in the world in, in, in Attorney Bolton, in, you know, him writing this and it meaning what, you know, is described here. Uh, so in that regard, <clears throat> you're either for or against that. Um, not to say that there couldn't be anything that's hidden or whatever, but... I think there's enough time between now and next Tuesday um, to for advance this, and if there are any, you know, significant uh, errors or whatever, uh, we can address them at the full board of aldermen. Um, but essentially, you either like this or you don't. Um, so, to me, it's a matter of. You know, is this how we want to fill a vacancy for um, this board and other boards, or do we want something else? Obviously, my opinion is this is the better way to do it. Um, and so I, I guess I would uh, encourage us to move this forward, and then uh, that way we'll be able to schedule a public hearing where people can come and tell us whether they like this change or not. Okay. Alderman Jetty. Um, you know, I, I support uh, Alderman Kelly on this. Um, you know, I've been watching the, uh, uh, you know, with all due respect to Attorney Bolton and, and uh, Alderman Clemens' uh, confidence in his drafting ability, he's, he's, ha he's struggled with this, you know. So this is the, th the third iteration. He thinks he's got it right, but I, I would like, I mean, I'm a lawyer, and I'm I'm having trouble reading this. You know, it's 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 not easy to read. It's complicated. Um, and you know, I think Madam Chairman, you suggested that um, you have a meeting, a special meeting of the committee, that would move things along. Um, you know, the, this work is supposed to be done in the committee, and um, if you send it to the full board of aldermen as is, you know, the rest of us are going to you know, struggle just like you're struggling, and and w what if they s send it back to you? Um, you know, why not do the work? Why not make sure that you're comfortable with it, that this committee is comfortable with it, and then can recommend it to the full Board of Aldermen with confidence? Um, I had, um, if I may, while the, the city clerk is here, you know, I, I had thought... Um, uh, I fully support uh, changing the, uh, the the way things are done now. Uh, the special election, 
the, uh, because of the turnout, because of the expense, because of the time that our volunteer uh, ward workers uh, spend on this thing, it's it's not working the way it is now. And I, I, I you know, I think this change is is a good change. Uh, but I also uh, value the the uh, voters' ability to give their input, and um, and I, I thought about um, you know rather than waiting for the next municipal election, uh, whether or not um, you know we could accomplish the you know avoiding the special election, accomplish the same thing, but you know make it the next regularly scheduled municipal or state election. So. It would, it would be just a year that you would have a, an appointed uh, member serving before an election. And uh, uh, Attorney Bolton pointed out to me that there may be some problems with that, and I've communicated with the city clerk, and she's indicated, yes, <laughs> there could be some problems. And while she's here, I'd like to give her a chance to, uh, to, to talk about what, that, what those problems might be so that my idea might you might say it's it's not workable and, and not worth pursuing. Yeah. Okay, does anyone else have, I'll speak afterwards, does anyone else have a um, comment be, and then I'll let um, City Clerk Piazzo speak on that um, question about having some, having a, a local election during state elections or primaries? Anyone, no? No, I, okay. I love the idea of just scratching off one of the additions here. <laughs> like, at least figure out what won't work. Yeah. Right. All right, so you are correct. I did talk with Alderman Jetty today and everything like that. So let's talk presidential primary. That is an election that we never know when the Secretary of State will declare that. They need at least a 45-day window to meet the UACAVA deadline and everything like that. But we, we are first in the nation. That would be very difficult to do. But that's also a party primary, which now brings me into the September primaries. If we were to do a September state primary, we have to remember that state elections are party elections. Mm -hmm. City elections are nonpartisan. So as a voter goes into the polling location, they do not need to declare themselves either <coughs> Republican or Democrat in order to be able to cast a ballot. So you're going to have those extra complications there where you would have to have additional ballot inspectors. You would have to have a second set of checklists just because if somebody does not want to declare themselves and take a state ballot, we need to have that because, again, we need to do the history of both voters. So, and again, there's still going to be those additional costs of the printing of the ballots, the coding of the machines, and the absentees and stuff like that, sending out the extra postage for absentees. So we will have those additional costs as well, besides, like I said, the scanning of the two elections. Depending on what type of election, so if we're looking now at a state general, whether it's a state general election or a presidential general election, I have a feeling this board probably would not want to have a presidential general election um, at the same time as we're having a special city election because, again, we would be looking at maintaining two separate checklists. Um, due to the fact that, again, in November 2018, we did that. Um, we gave every voter two ballots, but some voters didn't take their ballots or and the checklists weren't marked properly. So we, our election officials, need to mark on the checklist no state ballot or no city ballot. And some of our voters as well, um, the, what we call our UACAVA voters, which are the Uniformed Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act that respond to it. There is a 45-day window in, in order when we're doing a state election in order to get those ballots out. Due to the fact that our filing period currently is no well, earlier than no earlier than 40 days or no later than 30 days prior to an election, that causes the additional, again, second mailing of absentee ballots. So, and, and that's why, again, maintaining that second checklist and everything. And there's still a cost involved. You still have to print the ballots. And if it's a presidential election, you're going to be paying a much higher cost for the ballots. I will state that um, for the November 2018 election, just in the printing of the ballots alone, it was $9,200 just for those ballots. So that's not including the shipping of the ballots, which was another $444, the coding of the ballots and everything like that. So if it's tied in, you still will have those additional expenses. So those are some of the challenges 
that we would face. Okay. Alderman Lopez. A few things to clarify. Um, the November ones, those were the ones that got stuck in the machines, right? That is correct. <laughs> so that was a, awesome. Um, but then as an object example, there's a lot of Democratic presidential candidates. So if we had a municipal election, like, would they just be on the same ballot? They get squeezed in at the bottom or something? Or? Unfortunately, Alderman, we cannot put our city ballot on a state ballot. The state ba the city ballot would have to be a separate ballot and would have to be a separate color, cannot be the same. So to have a whole sheet of paper with two people on it. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do uh, Just like all the, the recent election. Yeah. <laughs> Alderman Kelly, and then I'll do Alderman Dowd and Alderman Laws. So excuse me if I missed it, but I wanted to know if you, you would have additional personnel because there is such a difference in a state versus a, a municipal election. That is correct. I would look at having additional four, and when you hire the ballot inspectors, you have to ha have an even amount. So it would be an additional four ballot inspectors. We're looking at a cost of up to $3,600 for those ballot inspectors. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Dowd. Yeah, two things. The whole purpose of this, one of the major purposes of this is to save money. We, we, it's going to cost additional monies if we try to tie it with a state or a presidential election, so I'd be totally opposed to that. The other thing is the poll workers and the, and the city clerk have enough to do in those two big elections and not be concerned with a city election at the same time. It's, I think it would be too confusing. It may, it, it add, may add uh, concerns in the election results. So I think this is the way we go. Uh, my opinion, I'm not on this committee, but I would be totally opposed to tying it with a state or, or a major election. Okay. Alderman Laws. That's exactly what I was going to say. I think the, the entire point of this is to make it cheaper and more efficient and it does neither of those things and i think that anybody who makes your job any more difficult should fight me in the street so <laughs> women kelly <laughs> women kelly so the question that i had as i read through this um if we have so i'm just going to use an example because it's easier for me to explain it if we have an at large person who comes in one year in and they're the ones that are, are up due. Then we have four board of at-large people that people would be picking. Do you think that would be confusing to voters? Do you follow what I'm saying? So if they're put on the next municipal election and there's three that are up, but they're not the they're not the one of the three that's up, there would be four that people would be choosing. Is that there would be two no. separate elections. One would be vote for any three okay. for the four-year term, there'd be a whole and section. the other one would be vote for any one for essentially two years and two months. So it would be separated out. Great. Thank you. Oh. Alderman Jetty. But it would be on the same ballot. Yes. Okay. You'd only have to print one ballot. Thank it's you. Like, you, you know, it would be, you know, vote for the mayor, vote for any one. Alderman at large, vote for any three. Alderman at large again, vote for any one. Board of Education, vote for any five. And it, you'd go down like that, all on one ballot. Okay. 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 So I have to agree with uh, Alderman Kelly and uh, Alderman Jetty. Committees are here to weed out the legislation to talk about it, to talk about amendments, how they can do it. If we take this and send it back to the board, I think there's going to be a lot of talk and questions asked. Do we do this? Do we do that? And this could end up being sent back. I don't have a problem with tabling, tabling it. And if the committee members were in agreement, you know, I'm looking that we could do a meeting like on the 15th in two weeks. And then it would go to the final board meeting in April. And then uh, if it had to come back, it would come back on May 1st. And uh, Corporation Council, the public hearing is usually at a committee level. It isn't always at a board meeting, right? Um, you can do it either way. OK, nothing so, you know, so we could probably, you know, if there was nothing there, we could probably do it say. as part of a May meeting. We have a budget meeting that evening, so it couldn't be in this chamber. Seven. And by the way, it's the police department. Well, 
Yeah. Could we do it early? Could we do it at six? Yeah. Could we do it at, if this is the if only. anyone will get us out on time, it's a police. As long as you end at seven. Well, if it's the only piece of legislation, I, I would think that we could get it done within. Or you could uh, do it in 208. We could, but I mean, if we, if we have enough of our committee that's available for 6615, I think we could certainly get it done in time. Um, so that would be my suggestion, but the committee, um, this is a committee, so you vote. Okay, Alderman Clements and Alderwoman Kelly and then Alderman Lopez. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind um, meeting earlier. Um, I can make that work. Uh, I do mind holding it simultaneously because I'm on the budget committee as well. So I'd like to be so there and here. Um, <clears throat> but the same day, different times, that, that, um, that would work for me. I think it strikes a balance of giving people enough time to read this and uh, get it to the full board in, in, a, in a good amount of time that we can then schedule a public hearing and, and get this out, uh, out the door. So um, I'd, I'd be fine. I would go along with holding that so long as we were going to do a special meeting. Okay. Corporation Council, did you have something to add? Yeah, if I may make a suggestion. If you're looking this over and you see where there appears to be a flaw or something you don't understand, uh, it might be wise and make your meeting on the 15th more efficient if you contact me in advance. And if I agree with you, I might be able to do some revised uh, version prior to the meeting, uh, or I might be able to uh, explain why what you're uh, interpreting is not really what it says, but just a suggestion. Okay, thank you. Alderman Kelly. I don't need to speak anymore. Everyone said what I wanted to say. Oh. Alderman Lopez. Um, should we attach this to the meeting minutes just so that it's in the um, record of what we're talking we about? We could have uh, Sue send us a whole new copy for that special meeting. Of the amendment, okay. So your motion was to to table until. Do you any say to table until we have our special meeting on April fifteenth? Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So we will plan uh, to have a special meeting on April fifteenth at around six six fifteen to discuss the. Resolution R-18-073 only. And we'll have uh, Ms. Lovering send us the amendment th that was put on our desk today. All set? Okay, so table. Thank you. Okay, unfinished business ordinances. Alderman Lopez. Um, I'd like to, do I have to, do we? Did we even table this, I think, the uh, parking ordinance? That's not on the table, right? That's just re been re-referred. Okay. I'd like to recommend indefinite uh, postponement. Okay. Okay, you heard the motion uh, by Alderman Lopez to indefinitely postpone 0 18 030. Any uh, comments? Alderman Lopez and then Alderman Law. I'm, I don't think it's going to end the world if we did at some point raise the lease parking, but I do think we clearly need a plan for what we're going to do in the parking garages for the lease spaces, what we're going to do for the metered spaces, what we're going to do for the spaces around it, because that's half of our conversation was more about things that weren't what we were trying to change than were. And I think the justification for raising it just because they do it other places which have completely different like economic scenarios going on and different dynamics. It doesn't make sense unless we have a clear purpose for it. So I would like to indefinitely postpone it. And if it ever came back, I'd like to see a specific like we would like to pay for a parking garage attendant or we plan to use this for a special revenue fund to keep maintenance on the parking garages up to date or like a specific reason to do this other than just we could get more money out of it. 
Okay, Alderman Laws. I, I agree with that, and I, I'm the one that sponsored this, and I completely agree with what Alderman Lopez is saying. I think that there might be a time in the near future, especially when the Performing Arts Center opens, where we might need to re, uh, reopen this and look at setting aside a special fund for a parking lot attendant or something like that. This is a conversation I had with Economic Development and the Downtown Improvements Committee several months ago, last year sometime, and uh, I really don't care either way whether or not we do it, and I, and I haven't heard any compelling arguments to support it, so I got no problem with tabling it indefinitely. Okay, thank you. Alderman Clemens. Thank you. Yeah, I was actually um, asked a bunch of questions, and we did get a communication tonight um, from Director Cummings about, uh, I guess, answers, answers to my uh, questions, but I was really disappointed in, in what I got because one of the things we received was a copy of uh, the 2006 garage reports, which we took care of those problems in 2010 with a, a, um, a bond, I believe, uh, for both parking garages. And so it wasn't relevant. And the other problem that I had um, was I asked for a list of you know, I asked for outreach to see who, you know, who who was spoken to as far as, you know, what what businesses um, lease there, who are the residential folks who uh, lease there, and the outreach that was done was or given back to me was at, and as the um, communication states that we received was while well, there was articles in the Telegraph. And I, the way I look at these things is, when you're gonna raise a fee on somebody, you better know what you're doing and why you're doing it. And to get a report back from 2006 of issues that were fixed in 2010 and say that the outreach was from, uh, was done through the newspaper, it, to me is in, uh, you know unacceptable um, and I can't justify raising parking uh, fees for the sake of raising parking fees because other cities charge more than we do the way I look at it then that makes us more competitive um, so I agree with um, Alderman Lopez and Alderman Laws about this I think there needs to be a lot more research done, a lot more outreach has to happen, uh, and we really need to understand what raising uh, those fees is gonna do to the lessees, but also what the benefit would be if we were to do that for them, uh, you know, if we were to do that to them, what benefit would they get out of it? And if it was a parking lot attendant, then it might be worth it but I don't know because I didn't get any of the answers that I asked for. So I certainly support indefinite postponement. Okay, you heard the motion to indefinitely postpone 0-18-030. Any more comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, indefinitely postpone. New business resolutions. Oh, Alderman Clemens. Thank you. Uh, R19120, changing the name of Panther Drive to Officer James Roche Drive. I would move to recommend final passage. Okay. You heard the motion. Any comments? Alderman Walshire. Thank you. I support this or, uh, ordinance. I, um, I'm sorry, resolution. I was approached by... Uh, John Yursak from the police department asking if we could change Panther Drive to James Rose Drive. Um, the, as the chief said, the police department is the only address. So this would affect no one except the police department and they're the ones requesting it. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a good piece of legislation and hope that you all support it. Okay, anyone else? Alderman Dowd. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do, uh, Chief, and it was uh, nice that they brought this forward, and we certainly 
uh, look forward to the change in name. Uh, so, hearing nothing else, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carried. Uh, new business ordinances. Alderman Clements. Thank you. Ordinance 1940, establishing an administrative services division and director position. I would move to recommend final passage. Okay. Gee, Mayor, you came just in time. It's like he was watching. Were you it's hiding? Like you were watching? Were you? <laughs> Thank you. But I was upstairs. Yes. <laughs> okay, Mayor, we'll uh, give you the floor so that you can um, give us a little history about this particular ordinance, if you would, please. I think everyone has a copy of the job description um, that I did ask Ms. Lovering to provide for the committee. All right, well, thank you, Madam Chair. So the when the city was reorganized, to run more efficiently um, it, during M Morris Arell's administration, the administrative services director position was created to uh, manage many of the city, internal city departments, personnel, assessing, IT, even though really there wasn't IT at the time, city clerk and other things. Since that time, IT was added. Um, and the first administrative services director was someone, Madam Chair, that I'm sure you know, um, remember, um, probably others as well, was Russ Marku, and he was uh, there during uh, Mayor Rell's time, during my term, and into, the, into Wagner's time. And then after he went uh, to another job, d ad additional people um, may have served in the interim. I wasn't watching that carefully, but the final... But the position continued through Wagner, through Davidson, through Streeter, so brought us up to the, you know, 2008-2009 time frame. And the last person who had the job was Maureen Lemieux, who was a very capable city administrator, formerly a member of the Board of Aldermen. <clears throat> um, later went on to be the CFO, I believe, for... She's got a big position with the city of Newton, but I, I believe it's CFO. She still lives in Nashua. But Mayor Lozo uh, wanted to, I think, undertake many of those duties herself, and she saw the need for city stats, so she asked the Board of Aldermen to approve a change that would substitute the position of city stat for the Administrative Services Director. And the Board of Aldermen approved that, and city stat existed for several years, but later was phased out. But the administrative services position was not recreated. All of the administrative services responsibilities were assigned to the CFO. So at the time the administrative services position was phased out, the CFO, you know, got everything. Um, personnel, uh, assessing, IT, city clerk, purchasing, risk, all the internal departments here, basically all the internal departments here. Now the CFO traditionally, and I think by expertise, is principally a financial officer. I mean, that's his principal job, is to oversee the finances of the city, uh, manage the financial, financial team, m work on the budget, uh, anal do budget analysis, also, uh, supervise the work of the annual audit, prepare work with the, with the auditors, pre prepare the so-called CAFR, the, the annual financial report that's done. And, I th and as a result, uh, because of expertise and just because of time, I think that his focus rightly remained on the financial, uh, the financial side of the city, where his principal expertise and responsibilities are, and I really believe that with that, it, that in hindsight, it may it was a mistake to, to eliminate the administrative services position. And I've really always thought that, but there was no particularly crying need for that, or it didn't seem as much. Um, then we did the revaluation, and you know, you've all you all know the history of that. We had KRT do the revaluation. Um, 
and uh, as a result of some of the comments that were made concerning the uh, and and because and we went outside to do that in part because we were concerned and I recommended it to you and you approved it we were concerned even though it cost money to bring KRT in we were concerned that because of the changes we could see in the residential market and the housing had gone up so much that the responsibility of handling that and explaining it to everyone involved uh, may have been beyond the chief assessor. So we went to KRT and they executed the revaluation. But follow uh, as a result of the follow-on comments and as a result of some of their observations during their revaluation regarding the complication of the systems that they found here and the the unnecessary complication in terms of the the back the background software and everything that allowed them to execute the the revaluation as a result of their observations as well we I asked uh, CFO Griffin and uh, Chief of Staff Kim Kleiner to do an audit of the assessing department. And you have received, of course, their report in writing. And what they found, and they made a number of recommendations. One of those recommendations is that we actually do, for the first time since 1991, that we do a full measure and list, meaning actually inspect the, at least offer to inspect all properties in the city. That has not been done since 1991. When I say offer, the reason I say offer is that no homeowner, no property owner is required to let an assessor in. So this would be voluntary, but still this has not been done since 1991 when I was actually mayor before, Madam Chair, and you were over at the Recreation Department. And um, uh, so they recommended we do a full measure and list. They recommended that we reinstitute the, that there was a lack of coordination among some of the internal functions in City Hall that should be working more carefully together. IT, GIS, uh, assessing. And that the administrative services position be re re recreated to manage these departments as well as some of the others in City Hall in a way to improve the operations of assessing. Uh, the a recommendation was also that the chief assessor position be eliminated. And the reason in, in part that we did that is that uh, I actually think that the department will, will be run more effectively without that position because what we need is management expertise there. If we need to bring in assessing expertise, we can do that through a contract with a provider such as KRT. But if the Board of Aldermen thought you wanted a chief assessor, I mean, you could put that in the budget and we could s search. The last time we did search, we had only one applicant, and uh, that was it. So there was no choice. Uh, but I think that's a decision kind of down the road if you wanted to, to look at that. But I can say that since we have been examining the assessing department in far more detail after the audit was completed, we have you know, seen how, how definitely the assessing function can be improved. <coughs> For example, there are, an, uh, there are tables which are behind kind of the, the, the results that some of the that that uh, that that are, arise during a revaluation, re and and there are uh, they they have discovered and w we have discovered in working closely with the people that are in the assessing, assessing department that the um, that the the tables are managed by a confusing interplay of software systems that really should be sympathetic that should be simplified, that 
um, a lot of the uh, that there definitely should be corrections, but things that can only be done in the context of, of a full measure and list list. One of the things that should be done is to remove uh, the unnecessary the 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 um, effective year built as such a predominant factor in the determination of value that condition should be the leading determination of value uh, not the effective year built a very confusing uh, factor that people have a hard time understanding and which is difficult to to really implement in a consistent way so um, in any event, uh, though that that as we have got, we're getting more deeply into the assessing function. That definitely the function can be improved. Uh, the the administrative services director can can undertake to do that. Uh, and but in addition, we need the administrative services director because we can make improvements in operations in other areas as well. IT purchasing. Uh, in terms of managing of union negotiations. We need someone who attends all union negotiations to articulate the city's position regarding benefits to all of the employer boards. So we have a consistent, we try to try to have consistency across the union contracts. I mean, there are so many um, different benefit systems that the that the software that we acquired um, really is uh, probably wasn't the right system. Very difficult for it to administer 17 different benefit systems at the same time. So there are many uh, improvements in city operations that we can, over time, accomplish if we can return to the administrative services uh, position. But since we since kind of assessing is what the audit which led to this definitely within the assessing department we can realize and are already i think beginning to implement improvements um, so you've seen the the job description uh the and uh, obviously i'm here to answer any questions or answer any comments or whatever you want to say about it uh, but the ordinance recommends that we follow the the audit I again I, I believe that the audit was very good I think that it's already resulting in improvements and in an ongoing fashion if we work the use the administrative services position to manage the assessing and other functions that we will see more effective city hall operations okay we'll start with members of the committee first Alderman woman Kelly I'm sorry <laughs> I know, you have to say his name a lot. I get it. Um, I'm going to support this piece of legislation. I had a good conversation with the mayor, um, and I think there are merits of reducing the burden to the CFO and also having that collaboration across the different uh, divisions that we haven't had past. I have to say I agree with Ms. Ortolano that I feel a little bit uncomfortable with getting rid of the day-to-day -day oversight when that, that's why we went into this audit. Um, so I think we need to consider, and as the mayor pointed out, it doesn't have to be right now, but I think we need to consider not necessarily just getting rid of the city assessor because um, I think that, that makes me uncomfortable. We're basically saying there wasn't enough oversight, so let's take someone, give them five divisions that includes this. Um, so that, those are my comments. All right. Alderman Lopez. I was just looking at the, the supervisory role um, and the number of departments. And, well, I could see specifically it makes a lot of sense to put, like, assessing GIS, uh, information technology, um, into some coordination. I was confused a little bit by the Arlington Street um, Community Center and, to some extent, the Hunt um, building. I mean, one of them is basically a, a combination youth program and events center. So we need a certain kind of supervision for engagement and recruiting and maybe maybe granting, uh, grant uh, fundraising and stuff. And then the other one, the Hunt Building, is like a combination of event space, office space. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about how a supervisor would corral all of that together. Well, the Hunt Building could remain under economic development. Um, uh, it was just to in a way the building maintenance would also you know the building function which is under risk would really be under the administrative services director um, 
and the, the, in a little, uh, so the hunt could remain under the, the economic development. The Arlington Street Community Center, only because it's just out there, and like who, who, who does that person really work for? We could have them work directly for the mayor. We could have them, you know, report to someone else. But this seemed like it made sense. Um, so there, I think it's to to give some continue, you know, to provide some management to that function. Hunt building, you know, could could go stay under economic development. I mean, I think as we the hunt building administrator <coughs> is actually beginning to work on Court Street. For example, the um, artist studios that we are leasing out on the lower level that were just completed and now have two or three applicants, uh, two occupants, um, those leases are being handled by the hunt building person, uh, Amy DeRoche. So, um, you know, that ex the hunt building, uh, excuse me, as we activate the court building, court street building, there needs to be more uh, direct involvement, I think, of somebody who's going to be managing the tenants and everything else. Now, Jay Honeywell does all of the physical maintenance of the building, but he doesn't, you know, deal with the tenants or the leases or what we're going to looking forward to the future of the building. So the Arlington Street Community Center, to me, to me the Hunt Building makes sense under the same, the same manager, but, it, uh, you know, if you said, well, you'd prefer the Hunt Building to remain where it is, I mean, I don't consider that like a big deal breaker or something like that. Alderman Lopez. I was just conscious of the model where the assessing office is, I don't know if I'm reading in between the lines here, but I'm going to say my impression is that it's actually inhibited by having the model that it has with that kind of supervision. So I'm not sure if that was the intent of this change, but I was imagining maybe Arlington in terms of its role and purpose might make more sense to be supervised by Parks and Rec because it would be supervision along similar lines versus, you know, the IT supervisor running a community Well, center. it's a little bit of a standalone function. I mean, they are very involved with uh, the schools, with the teachers at Dr. Crisp in providing enrichment and tutoring for students that need help in specific areas. And to me, it seems like that is a very critical role that that community center could play. And we should try to expand on that. To the, the school department has been very good in working with Megan and the other, Megan Karen, and no relation, right? No, no ma'am. <laughs> Somebody asked me, is that a relation? No, 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 no. 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 <laughs> Cause it's in Ward 7, of course. Um, uh, the um, I, they do a very good job. The they're volunteer teachers, but that could that is a ver that could be a, an increasingly important function that's played there, and so I'm not sure that the I mean it just doesn't fit that well under anything, and Park Rec may not be the right place either. Okay. Okay. Can Alderman Clements. Then. Thank you. Sort of along the same lines as uh, as as Alderman uh, Lopez was just pointing out, um, as I read this, um, I had some questions as to um, the director. It says the director <coughs> shall be responsible for maintenance and repair of all city buildings other than schools. And so my question to that, um, does that, in, so does that, that would include the fire departments, the police department, um, and other well, to the sort extent, of semi-autonomous? Well, to the extent, I mean, maybe that could be reworked a little bit. I mean, to the extent that we, well, certainly Building Department J. Honeywell works for risk. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of put under risk without risks. Some of these changes, you know, the manager, the CFO risks, it didn't, wasn't really looking for this. But um, the Building Department now works under risk. And risk works, uh, and and uh, um, and so risk would be under the administrative services director as we've proposed it here. Now, I think what they're trying to say is building functions that 
aren't directly I mean obviously they're not going to go over and take I mean this person isn't going to go into the fire stations and take over the maintenance because they're basically handling much of the maintenance themselves but to some degree we get involved I mean uh, for example when uh, when they wanted to in, they the fire stations wanted to increase the building security they came to City Hall and we worked out a bid and a system and we you and we used maybe this is where it this is probably where it comes from and we used the city building fund to pay for those changes right so there is an interplay but the person would not have the absolute authority to just go in and take over and run the fire maintenance of the fire station same with the police um, so I think maybe that could be worded more artfully to express the actual relationship that would exist. Mm -hmm. um, but we do use the city building fund at times to make improvements to buildings in those autonomous or sem semi-autonomous departments. Alderman Clements, you're welcome. Also, obviously, you know, along, along the same lines, um, you know, we're going to have the, hopefully we'll have the Performing Arts Center as a new um, city building. <laughs> and, you know, there, there are other, built home and stadium. I guess I'm just wondering, like, to what degree the umbrella will cover of the of the of this particular person, and if it makes sense to kind of maybe relook at this and kind of reorganize the way that uh, to really look at what's out there as far as city buildings go, um, and how much of a how deep we want to get this person involved in the inner workings of of different areas in in the city, because um, they're going to have a a large role as it is. Um, and the reason I bring it up is because I, I've been on the board before where, you know, you might have an alderman that, that takes this to the letter of the law. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think maybe, maybe we could relook at some of the way this is is worded well there's no there's no problem in rewriting this so the, the intent in, with respect to city buildings is really not to change any relationships that exist now for example Holman Stadium and that's really run by Park Rec right mm -hmm. I mean um, and you know why change it it's going right. you know it's working pretty well right so the, so to the extent this might imply that you know that that would change it wouldn't you know same with the fire stations i mean we work cooperatively if they need help mm -hmm. with a city building uh, you know if there were a roof repair that was an emergency we'd probably use the city building fund to do it you know immediately e even the, without with no money in the fire with no money in the in the fire department or whatever mm -hmm. um so we could rework this to kind of make this make what i think the reality is clearer than it is as you've suggested right here. Okay. I could yes. I will definitely do that and <clears throat> send it back to you. Great. Alderman Wilshire and then Alderman Dowd. Thank you. I was on the board when we had administrative services director and it's kind of a catch all. I mean, kind of someone that reports to the mayor and gets to see and know what's going on in the departments. I mean the mayor you know, he's got a high level position and he's not in the weeds every day, you know, looking at what each department is doing and, and nor should he be on a daily basis. I Literally mean really in the weeds at Holman Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Weeds. But um but, but I think it's no weeds. Thank you. Stadium. Thank you, Mayor. In the back of in the back. <laughs> I think it's an important position, um, you know, w when the prior mayor, you know, introduced city stat, we thought that might be good and helpful, but when that went away, it seems like things, nobody was kind of taking all these departments under their wing and looking at them individually and collaboratively, both. So I think this is a, a really good step to reinstate this position. I think it will help the mayor and the city overall. Okay. Alderman Dowd and then Alderman Laws. My initial concern is that this person is supposed to be diving into the assessing department and straightening that out. Um, 
which ought to be the main thrust of the initial application of their responsibilities. But to have all the responsibilities that I see listed here, uh, which I assume now a lot of these fall under the CFO. Yes, right now all of this, including assessing, plus all the financial business of the city falls under the CFO. So um, it's all under the CFO, assessing, purchasing, IT, all the financial stuff, uh, risk, everything is under the CFO. So my suggestion would be initially, anyway, have this position take on some of these, but the ones that are associated with revenue Mm. remain initially under the CFO, and that would include um, uh, city clerk, um, purchasing. maybe purchasing risk, purchasing. I'm not sure, but I don't think, because first of all, I think the person that's going to get hired is going to be from the outside, I'm guessing. <clears throat> They're going to come in and not know anything about any of these departments. And how can they focus all their attention or a vast majority of their attention on the assessing department when they're trying to learn all these other groups? Mm. I would suggest that the ones that have anything to do with revenue stay under the CFO, at least initially, until whoever comes in to fill this position gets their feet wet and has the assessing piece of this under control. My two cents. Okay, Alderman Laws. I completely agree with that. I just like the language cleared up a little bit more so we don't run into the same problem we had before with one person overextended trying to do too many, trying to fill too many roles. So. Okay, okay. Alderman Juddy, <laughs> Alderman Melissa Gola, then Alderman Wilshire. So when I look at the uh, ordinance, uh, Mayor, I see. Uh, uh, <coughs> It talks about uh, Section 5-33, Administrative Divisions, Officers and Employees. And under B, the administrative services, the administrative services of the city shall consist of the following divisions. And one is Administrative Services Division. And uh, two is Financial Services Division, et cetera. You know, it, it says the administrative services of the city shall consist of the administrative services division. It seems to be repeating itself, and I'm wondering, uh, under the organizational chart, the uh, this administrative services director will report to you. Correct. And the CFO is he is the CFO an equal player with uh, the administrative services director? Yes, they would be peers. So, in along with community development, uh, economic development, and the other departments, uh, public works, okay, public health, those are all reporters, you know, people who report to the mayor. But let me, can I, can I, part way through your question, answer some of it? Of we did track. And we didn't make this up out of whole cloth, as they say. We basically took the old ordinance, because we are trying to return to history to some, to, to some extent. We basically took the, whole, the, the old ordinance and used it almost word for word. I mean, there were a few changes. One is, in the old days, so to speak, the CFO actually reported to the administrative services director. <coughs> but that didn't, given the way city government has evolved, that didn't seem like it would be a positive change right you know, now. So uh, anyway, we track the old ordinance very carefully, and that probably was the way it was worded before. Now I see the, you know, the, 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 the issue you've raised, but that's, I think we just followed what, what it was there you know, before it was eliminated. Because we had legal research and go back and prepare something very close to what was done before. May I continue? Yes, Alderman Jetty. So, uh, <laughs> so if this change takes place, what, what will that leave for the, the CFO to do, and where does the treasurer tax collector come into this? 
So the, the, so the CFO will do what the CFO did before we eliminated the administrative services position. I mean, the CFO is the supervisor or the boss of the, of the treasurer tax collector. Uh, he manages the financial people who work for the city, uh, all of the financial functions, uh, uh, all of the accounting functions. He, the, the CFO, is one of the principal people involved in budget preparation. I mean, he does all of the budget analysis, all of the, ta you know, we project to you what the tax rate is going to be if you pass a certain budget. That's all, it's not, it's not really guesswork. It is, uh, it is an analysis done by the CFO and his team of how the tax, how it will come out given the tax base we have, if the budget is passed as proposed, with uh, all of the factors plugged in, you know, where the tax rate is, is, is going to come out. And, you know, they're always within a penny or right on or whatever. Um, so all of that work. There's an annual audit, which is very time consuming. The CFO works with the auditors. We obviously, as a public agency, we've got to be, have a clean set of books. Uh, the audits have been very good, um, very few comments, no criticisms in the audits. Uh, the CFO works with the treasurer, uh, with the financial advisors on bonding and in the bond rating and reporting to the agencies. Uh, there is an annual, what they call a CAFR, C-A-F-R. Uh, uh, it's the annual financial report, which is, you know, 100 pages. It, it, kind of grows from the audit, and that is supervised by the CFO. So the CFO has a lot to do when it comes to the money management, financial management, financial reporting, budgeting of the city. So uh, he or she had enough, had a lot to do before all these other functions were put under the CFO, and were you to pass this, uh, uh, the the CFO will still have enough to do. Okay. Okay. Uh, Alderman Jetty. Uh, one last uh, thing. I, I, uh, I know that you're uh, that you're recommending and planning on the uh, the city doing this full measure and list sometime within the next four or five years. Um, uh, will the assessing department with Without a chief assessor and with the people they have, will they have, will they be able to, to do that? Well, we, we would, um, with or without the chief assessor, we cannot do a full measure and list internally. I mean, there's not nearly the, the, the enough people in the assessing department to do that. Um, and no one who does that, uh, I, to my knowledge, does it internally. You bring in a contractor, and they send a lot of people out to go visit uh, 29,000 properties. I mean, that's what it takes, or to seek to, to, to inspect 29,000 properties. So the, so the, uh, this could not be done internally. What, we, what the audit recommended, and what I think we should do, is that we, over the next three years, do the full measure and list, that we that we take one third of the city and inspect all properties and possibly do a revaluation right at the end of that. I mean, maybe we don't wait the five years. Maybe we just do another one in three years after all properties have been inspected. So, again, we, that could not be done internally. It's an expensive thing. It has to be done externally. But I back to the chief assessor. I do see the administrative services issue and the chief assessor issue as two different things. Yes. It's two different issues. Yes, we did recommend, the audit recommended, and therefore I proposed in the budget that we remove the chief assessor position and add the administrative services position, in part because I want, you know, given the taxes and the budgeting issues we have, I wanted to propose a cost neutral approach. But if we could uh, come back to the Board of Aldermen and report periodically, monthly, quarterly, whatever you want, on how things are going with the assessing function. And together, we could decide whether we think things are fine and we don't need to make any changes, whether we need to bring someone in by contract to supervise, which a number of communities do. We could bring 
someone like KRT, not full time, but to provide periodic review and oversight. Um, or we, you know, you could put in the budget a full a new, new assessor. And if you did, we would try to find one. Um, I'm not really against it, but I just, you know, I think we, what I'm really saying is we need the administrative services director to help manage this department. Even if we had a chief assessor, a person with excess, assessing expertise may not be able to really understand, and I think we've, to be honest, we've seen it a little bit with maybe this one and maybe even the previous assessor. We need someone who can manage the department, who can get into these systems and understand them and implement changes that are simplify and um, provide more transparency and provide more accuracy with respect to the results uh, that are, come from the application of the various tables and other software functions that exist behind the kind of the whole system of assessments that you see. Now that was a long answer. I don't know. Did I really answer the question? Yes. No, not yeah, really. I think you did. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. All right. I'll let Alderm uh, woman Melissa Goler and then you, Alderman Wilson. Thank you. Um, I just, you know, I've read over this and, and in listening to the discussion here and having other discussion um, and Working in city government like Alderman Wilshire when there was an administrative services director, I certainly understand what you're trying to do. Um, and like Alderman Dowd, my concern is that what started all of this is what we see going on in the assessing department. And I'm concerned that this position as it's outlined now is just too much. And so just looking at, is there a way we can modify this job description so this new position has the time to spend managing that department? Um, because I think it's important um, and certainly see where it will um, bring some efficiencies in terms of how different departments are interacting. But my concern is the amount of time that person's going to have to really dig deep into what's going on there and and help manage that department if all of these other things that are listed that Alderman Dowd had already spoken to are part of the job description. Well, I would say if you were going to eliminate, now it would be in the, <coughs> in the ordinance first, you know, right. the, 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 the job descriptions in some degree backs up the ordinance. Um, I would say if you were going to eliminate things, I would first say uh, the Hunt Building. I mean, you know, it's kind of just a function. It could it could stay with economic development. <coughs> Tim won't maybe <laughs> won't love it, but you know, uh, I'm joking there. I mean, he he likes to work with uh, the Hunt Building, and there wouldn't be a problem there. Um, and so that's number one. Uh, number two, it, it, you could um, remove the city clerk, which functions with elections. Now, there are certain administrative things that, uh, you know, could be possibly improved, but the, certainly the elections, uh, they do a very good job. Um, those would be two things. Now, purchasing, I think, it should be left under this position. You should give this person the authority to uh, bring about improvements in uh, purchasing, which we're not going to see, I don't believe, unless, uh, which we've not seen to date, let's put it that way. And I think we, if you were to remove the Hunt Building, remove city clerk, leave purchasing, I mean, it, you know, the we're, we're still bringing about a big improvement in the sense that if this person can't manage this job, imagine what the CFO is dealing with. He's got like twice this, you know, twice this. So we're, no matter what is done, we're improving it. Um, uh, the, um, so I, yes, there is, should be a focus on 
uh, the assessing department, but I think as that progresses, the person can move, uh, can, can focus on other departments as well. I mean, I, I don't think it's beyond the capability of a single person to successfully or improve management when it comes to IT, assessing, purchasing, risk, city buildings. Or even city, I mean, city buildings is there in a part, in way, because it's already under risk. You know, it, so, and risk could be under this function. So, um, I mean, Alderman Clemens has pointed out that there's an, there could be an implication here that this is to expand the city hall's uh, res responsibility concerning city buildings, and that is not the intention. It's to kind of leave things the way they are, but just to, to point out that the city building function, the maintenance function, which is now under risk, would be, as it, as it currently exists, would be under this position. Are you all done? All, okay. Alderman Wilshire and then Alderman Dowd. Um, I, I agree with assessing being or needing to be the focus at first. And I think it'll take some time for this person to get up to speed because let's face it, there are a lot of different moving parts, right? You have you have standalone departments right now, initially, and when this person gets on board, they focus on assessing, and they spend time learning the other departments as well. Um, I think it's just a matter of time. I think one person can do this, and I think, like the mayor said, if we need to um, contract some of it to KRT or someone like them, that we have the ability to do that as well. But I think it worked well in the past when we had this position. I know Maureen Lemieux did a great job when she was when she was here. Um, so good that she got stolen by Newton Mass. <laughs> yes. Anyway. I mean, I we already since the audit understand the assessing function much more than we did before. There are definitely we do, we should do the full measure and list. There are definitely. Um, there's there are software software programs um, which sort of manage you know that uh, kind of oh, exist behind these twenty nine thousand properties that should be that 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 should be uh, simplified and as it has been described to me you know when a when a when a an issue came up and this was under the not the current the past assessor but under the other one the previous one who you know, had, had, a, had a very solid knowledge of assessing, but when a software problem came up, the fix was kind of a new program instead of a fix to the old one, and then there was a new program on top of that. There's a lot of complication that can be simplified. I mean, so um, anyway, I think, I, I mean, I know that uh, the city, the management of the city is much more engaged with assessing now than it was before and understands assessing far better than it did before and uh, that in with the full measure and list that we will really be able to see significant improvements in the assessing function. So I don't think it is uh, beyond a single person's capacity to give enough attention to that, especially if when necessary we can bring in someone like KRT while at the same time trying uh, to spend some time on the IT and the purchasing functions, where well, I think we can bring improvements. Alderman Wilshire. Thank you. I, I think from a prior meeting, I understood that we have a software program in place, actually several of them, right? Yes. Uh, the old admins and uh, a CES Pro or something. I mean, if you want to hear the details of this stuff directly, I mean, we can deliver a person to you who can explain all, you know, explain what the way we understand it now. But I am getting this secondhand. I mean, I'm not working. I mean, there's, we're having staff meetings down there and assessing frequently now. So um, I, you know, I'm getting this secondhand. So although I've met with the assessors, I'm not intimately engaged in the software and all of the... Uh, you know, back of the house, back back end functions in assessing. But if you want to hear about it and hear more directly what we have, 
and how what we have can be improved, definitely uh, we can bring someone forward who can explain those things. I would like that. That's because because here I am. I'm explaining me. I'm not a software engineer. I don't know that much about software, and yet I'm explaining secondhand things that I believe to be true. So I can definitely, uh, we can definitely, basically, whenever you want, bring someone in to discuss the details of all this in much greater detail than I'm able to do. So I think that would probably be something that you'd want before the full board, not just one committee. Perhaps yeah. We whatever. Could what, have a special special meeting whatever. Meeting just to discuss for that. that issue. Yeah. Okay. However you want to do it. All right. Alderman Dowd and then Alderman Lopez. Yeah. Um, we're interested. We can find out about the software and things, but the thing I'm more concerned about is the person that's going to be taking this role is going to have to learn that software. And from all the things I heard about assessing, this new person coming in is going to have to develop procedures and an overall plan for this department moving forward. To that degree, I agree that, that we probably ought to take the Hunt Building, you know, the city clerk, and maybe risk, because uh, it doesn't risk work pretty closely with financial um, oh, well, away, risk, away risk from this job description. I would say this. You know, look, risk is doesn't take that much management. So I would leave it where, it, where under this position. I mean, we have uh, Jen Deshay there. Risk functions very effectively. Um, I don't think uh, having risk under, uh, and she's, she, Ms. Deshay, has come before you, at least the Finance Committee, at various times to discuss <coughs> litigation and the like, settlements. That may actually be a reason for not putting them under this person, at least initially. And certainly the city clerk does need a lot of oversight. Um, again, I, I think that the person filling this position coming in here is going to have to get up to speed on all the city hall. Maureen Lemieux was mentioned. Russ Marku was mentioned. They were both aldermen. They knew city government before they, they ever got into that job. They were both aldermen. The other thing I wanted to say is, is, is I remember Maureen Lemieux's office. It was more than her in that office. So how many support people are, is this person going to have? Well, we're going to reorganize some of the support personnel. I mean, I'm trying to propose, a again, a cost-neutral, let's not raise taxes kind of solution to you. And yeah, we could add a whole bunch of people. but. <laughs> Excuse me. I mean, I'm trying to. Got we've got budget problems. We need ELL teachers. We need police officers. So, I'm trying to, uh, <coughs> you know, give you a solution that, that I believe that, and I and I, I think we're showing some results that can work without increasing costs that much, and suggesting that we monitor what's going on carefully as time goes on and make decisions as time goes on if we think we need more help. So I, I would be fine with this if we took some of the burden off the Hunt Building, the city clerk, and, and if there were any others. But uh, <laughs> I would like this person to come in, get familiar with city government, familiar with city hall, focus at least half their time on the assessing department to do these procedures and overall plan, at least initially, and see where that goes. Alderman Lopez? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, because I'm getting the sense that we don't have all the information here to make a movement tonight, but out of respect for the public that came out and made considerable public comment about two hours ago, can we table this until we can have the presentation that was just discussed? Yes, Mayor. Well, here's the problem I have with that. Look, I mean, we want to get going. To the extent we delay, we delay, we delay, we discuss, we discuss, we discuss. Yes, we're making improvements in assessing right now, but it would help to be able to move forward with the reorganization, with the audit, and, you know, get the stuff done. So if we delay this for a month, Okay, well, we just delay doing anything about assessing. We will be working on it in the interim, but we delay the solution by a month in reality. 
To that point, though, I would say this is a pretty, this is not just the assessing department. You added a lot of departments. So while the assessing department is urgent, <coughs> affecting the infrastructure of the all of these departments at the same time is not necessarily something we should do very quickly. You don't have okay. to call on yourself. I know, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of that. Okay, I have a question, Mayor. This position cannot start until July 1, right? Because it's new, it will be new to the budget? Um, we could start it, uh, we could, I mean, it's only a partial year, right? So, to the, so as soon as uh, we have someone, we could transfer money in. Okay, thank you. Alderman Wilshire, did you have a... That's what I would say. Okay, thank you. I, I already forgot what I was going to ask. Okay, <laughs> anyone else? Oh. I believe that you already have this position in the budget. It's in the budget. Well, but we, we, she's asking, could we start it before the budget, before July 1? And my answer is yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. Alderman Melissa Garland. I guess to that, I, I, there was something else I was going to ask, and like Alderman Wilshire, I forgot. Um, um, but... Um, Mayor, how long do we think it will take to advertise and find someone from for this position? What what's the timeline that you're looking at? I think we can find someone quickly. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Okay. So I get to speak. And um Yes, I was here when Russ Marco became the first administrative assist, uh, director. And it was a good, good position because he was able to work everyone together. Um, and then when Maureen took over, that was um, another excellent pairing with working with the mayor and these departments. Why it changed? Everyone wants something a little bit different. I agree that you could probably take the city clerk out of here in the Hunt community, but all these other departments were part of the administrative service division before. Our problem is with one particular department, and as I spoke to you, Mayor, my concern about eliminating the chief assessor, because this person is gonna oversee other people, and obviously they're gonna take a, a, a greater interest with assessing until we get back on our feet. So I want to make sure that if there was a need, it doesn't have to be called a chief assessor, it could be someone else that has that knowledge in assessing that can oversee it and is reporting directly to the, the division director so that they know what they need to do at any given time. I think that the budget should have the chief assessor's line in there with a dollar so that you're not trying to reinvent the the wheel. I think this is a, a good thing. I don't think that we need to table it. I think you could just bring back this job description and the um, the ordinance as amendment for the next meet, board meeting and make those minor changes. Unless someone really sees something Madam Chair, I do have another okay. idea as far as something we could remove. I mean, we could have the Arlington Street Community Center report to the mayor's office because kind of, that's kind of what Isn't happens what they're doing now, now, right? I mean, it's just... Uh, so if we took out the Hunt Building, we take out the Arlington Street Community Center, we take out the city clerk, the other def functions should really all be working... I mean, they're, they're more extraneous, right? Mm -hmm. So the other functions are working within City Hall more carefully. That mm -hmm. reduces the responsibility but allows the administrative services director to focus on the departments within city hall who work excluding also the city clerk that work together in terms of the internal operations of the city basically i i, I agree i think that um like i said they were part of this before so i think that they could still work together and um yeah, the person who comes in and takes over has to take a big leap. We have to have a, big, a lot of faith that that person's going to be able to go in there. And some of the things that are probably happening within a department, it's internal, so that person can see and correct 
make changes as needed um, in how policies and procedures are put into place. I don't think that um, that person isn't going to be knowledgeable or be able to, to do that. And of course, they report, all these division directors report directly to the mayor anyway. So they're not going to do anything without his final approval. So I, I don't have a problem with this. I just feel that that title, chief assessor or acting manager or whatever, needs to be there so that six months down the road that the board sees that there might be a problem, make the suggestion, hey, you need to look at bringing somebody in to help well, get that we, back. So what I could do is I could get the amendment prepared for the board meeting that would eliminate the three departments, the three areas we've discussed. The uh, Arlington Street Community Center, the Hunt Building, and City Court Clerk. Street to the extent that would be included, and um, City Clerk. And uh, the City Clerk. Yep. Uh, also, again, I'm not. I tw I wanted to propose to you a cost neutral solution. So if in reviewing and and I, I can get people to report to you what's going on with assessing. You know, whenever you want. Uh, you know, once a month, once every two months, whatever you want. Um, <laughs> If going forward it seems like we really need the chief assessor or we should have KRT or someone providing supervision, <laughs> um, it's not like I'm against that. I'm not. You yeah. know, that if it seems like that's what's required, let's do that. But I don't think we should, I'm just asking you not to hold this up now over whether we're going to have a, or whether we're going to have a chief assessor, which really is a budget decision made I mean, we can give you various reports between now and June, and if it seems like a chief assessor is needed, put it in the budget. Right. And well, if you do, we'll try to hire it. No, I'm not looking that we would uh, that we would hold this up. I think we could put this, make those amendments for the for the full board meeting, and and act on it. I just want that in yeah. the back of your mind that we could do that. I don't sit on the budget committee, but that, I'm sure that's something we could do and. I'm sure the president of the board could set up a meeting so that we have some kind of uh, report, yeah. quarterly or whatever. Um, Alderman Clemens, did you uh, have something? Yeah, I, I, I was going to amend my uh, motion to recommend final passage. I would, um, I would move to um, recommend final passage with the understanding uh, of the coming amendment from the mayor's department or the mayor's office yeah we can get that done you know before the to go out with the agenda uh which will be Five. wednesday or, or friday mm -hmm. yeah. okay all right so alderman clements has may changed his motion do we have any discussion alderwoman kelly um just wanted to ask about the special board of aldermen meeting that we discussed would we still intend in doing that would it be specifically for this piece or just about the assessing department. I just want to make sure I understand what that. My intent was the assessing. So an overall. So understand the function and what's going on. OK, yeah. not necessarily this piece of legislation. Not, no, Thank not you. necessarily. No. Anyone else? OK, the motion is before you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? OK, motion carries. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, Miss Loveling will be happy to get that information. All right, we appreciate I apologize it. to everybody who waited so long. <laughs> Sorry, um, <man. laughs> and because I've promised Alderman Jetty, I do support. He he wanted me to, you know, I know that there's differences of opinion on this <laughs> legislation, but to the extent it matters to anyone, which it probably doesn't, I Thanks support the legislation. Well, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> All right. You don't get to vote, though. <laughs> okay, so... Tabled in committee, Alderman, Alderman Lopez. Uh, recommend, or I'd like to make a motion to remove from the table and recommend final passage. Okay, Alderman Lopez has asked to take off the table 0-19-037 and to recommend final passage. Any question, Alderman Lopez? Uh, I mean, is... Did I succeed in my double motion, or do we have to take it off the table first? No, we got to take um, a motion 
to take it off the table first. All those in favor to take the ordinance 0 19 -037 off the table. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And Alderman Lopez, you are recommending final passage of 0 19 037. Yes. And I'd like to speak to it. Yes, you may. Um, and may we have the uh, chief come up and join us, please? Chief Lavoy, thank you for your patience. Because I know last time we had questions, but we probably all forgot them now. I'm going to sit here and then we'll go to my spot. Thank you, Chief, for joining us. Sure. <clears throat> okay, Alderman Lopez, you're first. So um, I, I held back last uh, month because I thought my role was really to introduce and let um, Alderman Jetty uh, make his piece. Um, as the only sponsor, but besides Alderman Jetty, um, this came without fanfare and it was introduced to the board. So I think it took people a little bit off guard that it was even happening and they wanted to kind of see where it was going if it was possible, what the support would be. Like it was, it was just out of, kind of out of nowhere. Um, it wasn't for me though, my experience working in with teenagers and after school programs, um, with people working, struggling with addiction, there's a very clear relationship w between all of the factors that we're talking about, whether it's adults with addiction, whether it's kids first taking those steps down that road. Um, and it's not clearly, it's not as blatant as, well, anyone who picks up a cigar is immediately going to be an addict. Um, but there is a relationship between people who pick Bless up you. an easy to access um, habit and then it translates to a chemical addiction versus a behavioral addiction and then it becomes a lifelong habit. And there is an abundance of medical research which shows that once you begin, you go down the path of behavioral addiction, you are configuring your brain to be much more receptive to addictive tendencies to experience mood disorders, impulsivity, a number of factors that we look at people as adults and say, wow, if only this could have been changed. Like, how did this, how did this person get this, this way? And there's very clear evidence, and there has been for decades, as to how addiction first starts. They're just, politics have always gotten in the way. Um, it's always been somebody else should do it, somebody else should make the stand. Why didn't the federal government do it when they, they started uh, raising the age in the first place? There's always gonna be why don't why doesn't somebody else do this? So, in my opinion, when the motion was being proposed, uh, the ordinance was being proposed, it wasn't necessarily time to make a decision, but it was time to hear the argument. Um, so I appreciate that we've gotten this far and that we're um, we're in this meeting on the first day of Public Health Week. And I really appreciate the public comment that's been made um, on behalf of uh, the legislation. I think it was said in the public comment that youth will pave the future. This is the way the wind is blowing. For me, it's a matter of how many people can we help now with legislation. I think this ordinance is well within the city's uh, authority and scope. It's not an overreach. We, ha we actually have a, a city ordinance that outlaws dancing after 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. in the morning because you can't have somebody dancing at 2.15. You haven't been to Alderman Dove's house. Well, I, you know, I just, I apologize to Chief Lavoie for the burden that must place doing all the stings on the dance clubs. But we have laws to interdict certain behaviors that are undesirable. We have some silly ones, but this one is not silly. It's a public health issue that we've known about for years. And it's a little bit harder to grasp as a reality because we're talking about kids and we're talking about the impact that 18 and 19 year olds who can legally obtain cigarettes, e-cigarettes, vaping, all of that nicotine and tobacco products, the access that they have to younger kids. But we're also talking about looking forward to families that have parents that they've lost too early or sisters or brothers that are struggling with it. People who are changing their lifestyle because they can no longer breathe properly, because they're struggling uh, to fight cancer. These are things that are directly associated with tobacco use and they're fueled by the chemical addiction, which is prompted by nicotine. So we know this. We, all three states around us know this. They've already made decisions to raise their, their smoking age to 21. 
I understand the concerns from a business perspective at any kind of change that might limit your potential population to sell to. I think most of our cigar shops don't seem to sell to mostly an 18 to 20 year old population. It seemed to be hard to get them to come out. It wasn't hard to find kids that were willing to speak up against it. So I think there might have be an impact on the smoking community. I think there might be a, an impact on the cigar shops in the near future if we pass this. But I think the real impact is going to be further down the road, and that's where we need to look at money versus health. Are we trying to make money off of addictive substances? Are we trying to make money off of issues that cause a bevy of public health issues? Or are we looking at the public health and are we looking at the future and listening to constituents who come forward and say, this is what they want? Okay. Uh, before I call on uh, Alderman Clemens, at the last meeting, um, there were some questions concerning if this was put into effect, how the police department would handle it considering that towns and cities around us at this point in time do not have this age limitations. So if you could, I know you have to uh, enforce the law, but how would you, how would you be able to enforce it? Well, uh, you know, as chief, uh, I, I, when it comes to city ordinances, I try my best not to advocate for or against. I mean, I, that's certainly uh, the older men, the older men and women's purview and the citizens purview. Certainly with the enforcement leg of that. And as long as you're making a city ordinance, which we uh, have confidence is legal, which we certainly do. Uh, you know, Attorney Bolton, uh, you know, we have no doubt that uh, has reviewed this and I've reviewed it. It certainly appears legal. Um, enforcement's our job. As far as how will we enforce it, in my opinion, the possession portion of this ordinance is the key to the entire ordinance. If you don't have the possession ordinance in it, you might as well not even have it because then everyone can literally just go purchase at another another jurisdiction where it is allowed and bring it back. The way this ordinance is written now, it, it bans possession of it. So it doesn't matter if you, you purchase it legally in another jurisdiction, in my opinion, you're still possessing it. And I, I can equate that to laws and ordinances. Uh, you know, in, in the great state of uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, you're, you can possess 10 ounces of marijuana for recreational use, which is, you know, by my math, more than a half a pound of marijuana. You can't do that in New Hampshire yet, thankfully. And, uh, you know, you can be in the parking lot of the Fensley Mall and uh, you come across in, into Nashua and it doesn't matter that you're allowed to do it in Mass. You're no longer in Mass. We have laws against that. You're going to get, uh, you know, arrested for that. Uh, consequently, too, our, our carrying a concealed weapon or even having a handgun, uh, you know, there's virtually no restriction on that if you're allowed to have one. Yet, if you go across in the parking lot of the Fez Lane Mall, you're going to go to prison for having that same handgun if you walk out the wrong entrance. Um, so again, it doesn't matter if it's legal in a certain jurisdiction. You come into another jurisdiction where it is not legal, whether that be law or ordinance, then certainly you're breaking that law or ordinance, and the police will enforce that. As far as you know, logistically, how will we enforce it? It's a city ordinance with a monetary fine, so it's giving somebody a summons in, unless they are in fact under 18. Certainly, then they get a summons, but they also their parents get notified, and and they uh, have to h handle it as a chins offense or depending on their age. There's like 27 different factors. If they're under under 13, it's handled all different ways. Um, you know, it's a city ordinance violation. We certainly, uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you we don't have the manpower to do that. That's not true at all. We, we certainly have the manpower to enforce any city ordinance. I will say you change the age from 18 to 21, and it most definitely is going to increase that contact. But I can't imagine that would be something that, you know, I'm telling you, we will enforce it. And I can't imagine that would be something that would exceed our, our manpower and personnel. And, you know, at least initially, I would imagine there'd be a, a lot of enforcement activity until people realize certainly uh, this is an effect and then I would imagine it, it would be cut back somewhat, I would hope. But again, uh, our job to enforce it, uh, we have no problem doing that and you know, certainly we do have the manpower to do so. Thank you, okay. Alderman Clemens. Uh, yeah, my, I have a couple questions for the, for the chief if I could. Certainly. Um, so under, under this provision, um, if you're, you, so 
from what I understand is is it that if somebody was passing through Nashua from Hudson to Hollis um, and they were stopped uh, and they were say 20 years old and had a pack of cigarettes on the front of their seat uh, they would get a fine is that correct well, certainly there's always the officer's discretion, but certainly they would be violating the city ordinance like, because they are in possession. You know, I'd be, what you're describing is what would be considered a secondary um, contact, which in my opinion would be uh, the vast majority of our dealings with that, such as, you know, we get called for something else. Um, you know, I'd be, I certainly don't want my officers, uh, you know, oh, that person looks like they're under 21 and, and having that as a sole reason for the stop. And that's certainly something I can address in, in, a, in a policy and a procedure within my department. Um, but again, that's, that's a secondary offense. It's, it's just like you have anything else, else there, you're violating that ordinance. And certainly it is the officer's discretion, just like giving somebody a summons for a moving violation is ultimately the officer's discretion. But yes, it, it says possession, you would be, in possession in Nashua, which the ordinance prohibits. Okay. Alderman Clemens. My second question is, is how would you enforce um, a large event? Let's say uh, the stroll, for example. If there were, uh, you know, a group of kids that were on, you know, break or whatever, and came to Nashua to the downtown stroll, and a few of them were smoking. Uh, maybe they look like they're under 21. I don't know. How would you approach those individuals? Would you stop them? Would you ask them for their IDs to identify themselves? How, how would that interaction go? Well, certainly, uh, it's like anything else. An officer can go talk to anybody. I mean, uh, you know, it's, especially if they're just walking or something like that. Uh, you, you know, the officers certainly can contact them, and express their concern. Um, you know, again, it, it, I don't want to use the term it's only a city ordinance violation because we have city ordinances for a reason. But, you know, there's nothing, it, we're not going to shut the holiday stroll down with a line of, of officers and, and search people's property. Of, um, I, I know you don't mean that drastic of a no, scenario. No. But, you know, I, again, I mean, a, a lot of this stuff is a secondary offense, but certainly nothing prohibits the police from walking up and talking to anybody. And if they're walking, they certainly don't have to talk back, quite frankly, if they don't wish. Um, you know, so that's, and that's a law as well. So, you know, certainly when the police aren't using it as a vehicle to contact people for other methods is basically what I'm telling you straight up because mm -hmm. we we'll certainly have a policy to prohibit that. But, uh, you know, again, I, I certainly don't think that's the intent of the ordinance in the first place. And it's just like any other ordinance. I mean, we have leaves in, in you know, in the road ordinance. We have snow getting blown in the mm -hmm. ordinance. We now have a chicken ordinance. We have all kinds of ordinances. <laughs> And, 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 put someone in and we will happily enforce that if it's broken, <laughs> is, you know, if, if they break no that. Mistakes. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's just another ordinance. Granted, it, it certainly has a, a lot of potential ramifications, but, you know, the police, we look at it the same way. You know, certainly it, it's our discretion. If you're violating it, you know, we certainly can give you a summons for it. Okay. And certainly seize the product as well. Alderman Clements? Yeah, I so I thank you for your responses. I, I appreciate that, and and quite frankly, that that is a, your responses were exactly what I what I had envisioned happening. Um, and you know, it's it's I could see somebody arguing this point uh, on on a state level um, where you know they may want to equalize the um, the balance of it and say, you know, it, it's a public health issue that, that, that affects the state, not to say it doesn't affect Nashua because it does, but we have businesses here that, uh, you know, are longstanding businesses in the community. Um, and I, although I am not a smoker, um, I do understand that, you know, in my opinion, if you are an adult, you have the right to engage in adult behavior, and one of those behaviors uh, is smoking. Um, you know, I'm not inclined to support this ordinance uh, because I don't think that I, I come from a standpoint of 
I enjoy my liberties. And although I find smoking offensive and I don't, you know, would never do it myself, um, I do enjoy cigars every once in a while. So I guess, I don't know, does that make me a hypocrite? I don't know. I look at doing a, a, a vape and a cigar as two different things. A cigarette somewhere in the middle, maybe. Um, but I look at this as though it's, um, for me, it's a, it's a personal freedom. Uh, and I was elected to protect the rights of minorities. And, you know, I appreciate the fact that all of the people here care about our youth and youth care about youth as well. But I don't think that banning uh, a product for an adult at any age is necessarily the right thing to do for a certain age group of that subset of adults. Uh, if you're going to ban something, ban it because it's a terrible thing or don't. Um, and in my opinion, cigarette use or nicotine use is something that is a personal choice that people make. Um, I understand the, you know, the point here is to curb youth smoking. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that. But at the same time, if a merchant is giving or selling tobacco products to a person who is under the age of 18, they're breaking an existing law. If you know a brother or sister gives their uh, sibling tobacco products and that person is under the age of 18, they're breaking the law. Um, same thing is if a, if a parent were to do that. So that, I think, is where the focus really needs to be. Um, because to say to a law-abiding person who is 19 and wants to go to Castro's or to Two Guys or anywhere else in the city uh, to enjoy a cigar uh, or a cigarette or whatever, um, to tell them that they can't do that is to take away one of their rights that they hold now. And I will not do that. I will never be on record to take away a right that somebody has now and, and, and rip that away from them. I won't do it. Okay, any, any uh, committee members? No? Okay, Alderman Dow. Yeah, I don't smoke, and uh, <clears throat> although when I was in the service and a little while after, I occasionally would have a cigar. Um, I don't like people smoking. I don't oppose it if they're old enough. I am not going to tell them they can't. Um, but when it comes to kids, it's a different story. Um, I'm totally against vaping. And I definitely would support banning vaping till they're 21. I don't have a problem banning cigarettes till they're 21. Just, um, a couple of, um, you know, being what a lot of people call me a moderate, I always look for a, some sort of middle ground. Um, first of all, uh, I would hope that if a kid's not, 21, that, and they work at Market Basket or, or Hannaford's or any of the other stores, that it's not against the law for them to sell it to adults. Um, just like liquor, they can't sell it to 21-year-old. Um, but, you know, because that's going to put a burden on the store. But they're not using, they're not possessing, they're selling to legal adults if they're over 21. Um, and 
the discussion about one of our veterans having a cigar when he comes home from service, I can tell you that in the military, there are a lot of uh, soldiers, sailors, Marines, special forces that smoke cigars to take a little stress off being in combat. So perhaps, you know, if, if, um, if it's possible, and uh, of course legally that'd be a part of the question, you know, if they're in a recognized cigar store like Castro's and Smoke Shop, if they're in that store and smoke a cigar and they're between 18 and 21, I'd be fine with it. Uh, I don't know if you can make that distinction, but I will say, as, as far as the, the cigarettes and the vaping, no problem banning it till they're 21. I don't even think they ought to have it after that, but that's beside the point. The other thing is, uh, I fully believe that this ought to be a state issue and belongs up in Concord, but like in a lot of things, they're dragging their feet, you know, um, and it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. So maybe this is a push. Um, but I think we ought to look at, at some lightening of it in the fact that, you know, the kid's working at a job at Hannaford's or, or another grocery store, and, the, and somebody adult comes up, and they're obviously over 21, and they want to buy a pack of cigarettes, they can sell it to them without having to, whoop, wait, I got to get a manager to come, you know, I mean, that's crazy. And, you know, if there's a recognized cigar establishment, that if somebody comes in there between 18 and 21 and they want to smoke it in the establishment, I don't have a problem with it. Taking it out, that's a different story. Um, whether you can make those changes or not, I'm not on this committee. But I'll be thinking about that when we go to the full board. Okay, Alderman Loss and then Alderman Lopez. Uh, first of all, Chief Lloyd, thank you very much. I was, I was actually kind of surprised by uh, your responses, but I, I shouldn't be because it makes perfect sense. <laughs> Uh, How so? <laughs> I, I would like to. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I, I was just expecting more opposition to it, but then you, you articulated it perfectly clearly. And you're absolutely right. You guys are more than capable of handling anything that we pass here. And I would, I would respectfully ask my honorable colleague, Alderman Clemens, to harken back to a time where you had the right to buy Coca Cola that had cocaine in it, or buy uh, cough syrup that had opium in it or insulate your house, the right to insulate your house with asbestos. And those all became public health issues. Mm -hmm. And I think right now we're dealing with something that kills one in five adults, uh, more than gun violence, HIV, uh, alcohol abuse, and drug overdoses combined. And we have the opportunity right now to prevent children like myself, who's been struggling with nicotine addiction since I was about 18 years old, prevent a few of them from ever going down the road of addiction, not just with nicotine, but also with, as Alderman Lopez has pointed out, uh, it changes the chemistry of your brain to make you more susceptible to addiction to other things. And we're dealing with an opioid crisis right now, which is another public health issue. And I think that uh, it's our role as community leaders to look at these very difficult uh, questions and make tough decisions about them. And I, of course, I don't want to see any businesses, particularly uh, one of the citizens who came to talk tonight employed me for several years, and I'm grateful to him, and I don't want to see him lose any money. But I also, I, I, you got to look at the cost-benefit analysis of this, and it, 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 I, I don't want to sound hyperbolic here, but are we really going to say that it's more important to uh, to make some money than it is to potentially save the life of somebody? Because I, I just don't see how that plays out. Okay, Alderman Lopez had his hand up and then well, can Alderman. I, can I respond to, since I was mentioned directly? It, do you mind, Alderman Lopez? No, if, okay, question. go ahead, Alderman Clements. Thank you. I, I, the things that you mentioned, the cocaine and Coca-Cola, the asbestos, things like that, they're banned for everybody. 
issue, not just 18-year-olds to 21-year-olds. No one can go out and legally snort a line of Coke or put it in Coca-Cola. Nobody can legally go out and put asbestos in a home anymore um, because those public, they are public health problems that the government recognized was a problem for everybody. Um, cigarettes is, are, are a legal drug in, in the United States. It's a legal drug in New Hampshire. And if you're 18, you should be able to use it. Okay, Alderman Lopez and then Alderman Luizago. So to the point of legal drugs, I think the, my understanding of what was said was to point out that things change over time as we have more understanding. So yes, some things were legal in the past, they aren't now. We're the legislators here. We're the ones with the decision in our laps because the state hasn't done anything. I'm not sure if anybody's doing an informal poll, as I am, of who's opposed and who's not, but I'm not seeing all of our, our state representatives coming forward and saying, oh yeah, you guys need to move this. So I, there's nobody to make this decision but us right now for the city of Nashua. Um, and we do restrict rights. We're in the middle of looking at, right now the public has a right to a special election every time there's an opening and we're about to modify that, change it. That's a right everybody is not going to have because we're gonna have boards self-select their own members. So obviously that's worth heavy consideration. And so, so is this. Um, with regards to age limits, the age limits in New Hampshire are ridiculous. You can be 16 years old and get married. You can be 16 years old and divorced. Then you're 18 and you can have, you can adopt a child after being married and divorced probably. The age limits don't make any sense. So we already do restrict smoking to people under 18. We already are taking rights from some and not for all because we've concluded, I guess, in some point, that 18 year olds, that's the magic number where you're a fully baked adult. Science, cognitive uh, awareness, like this is new stuff. We haven't really been able to look at the brain, you know, in the past without cutting the, the skull open. Now we can watch how things happen and we understand that addiction is not so clear cut as, oh, you're an adult now. Now you can, you can, you can blow your whole life with some bad decisions. Biology does not follow our own legal traditions. So there's always a point where someone says, you know what, kids who are 12 probably shouldn't be working in factories. This is similar, where we're letting, uh, we're trying to have kids be able to develop in a healthy way to extend lifespan. Public health is not doing bad. We're living longer than we ever have before. So if we have people who are dying 20 years earlier than the average person who doesn't smoke, it's something we need to be looking at. In addition, I would also say that I, I do want some clarification on Alderman Dow's um, proposal because I don't even know if it was a possibility, but is it possible to expect that a, an individual 18 to 21 who purchases a single use cigarette, can the amendment be written that way, Attorney Bolton, so that they could use it on site? Because, <coughs> okay, so cigars are okay, cigarettes though, so, whoa. That's not a scientific. But that's what. Yeah. That's what I know. I know. My, okay. But I think legally they would treat it as a product, right? No one's going to say like, "No, you got a cigar. That's a vape." No, it's not going to work. So legally speaking, can you can you age restrict a product to a site? I don't see why not. There may be reasons I'm unaware of, which I'll have to research. But as I'm sitting here, I think you could allow on-premises smoking of cigars while still. Uh, banning cigars off premises and banning vaping or cigarettes. You'd have to do something about a definition as to a cigar, but that must be available somewhere. So. And out of obligation to some of the constituents that I talked to, um, I did talk to the vape shop, and so they consider themselves harm reduction. Whether that's medically borne out or not, I think that's a point of debate, but they consider themselves a bridge from chemical addiction with nicotine to you can substitute with something else and then you can replace that and replace that. So I mean, in my experience, that's not exactly how um, addiction works, but I think it, it is worth pointing out that while vape is the current devil that everybody's talking about in the room, nicotine and tobacco are what the ordinance address, addresses because chemically those are the things that are most immediately harmful. Yes, some forms of vaping um, also contain carcinogens and, and uh, um, a number of, of, of bad things. And yes, 
vaping specifically might need to be looked at because it wasn't really well vetted when the FDA first approved it. But this ordinance is talking about nicotine and tobacco for a reason. Nicotine's the addictive, addictive substance and tobacco is the carcinogen health nightmare. Yes, thank you. Um, it just to kind of continue with Alderman Lopez's um, comments, if you look at the research that comes out of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Institute of Health, um, they're both really clear about the impact of nicotine, not only in terms of receptors and addiction, but also on just frontal lobe development. And with all of the brain research that has come forward in the past 10 to 15 years, we know that the human brain is still developing beyond high school. Um, and we know that there's still things going on in the frontal lobe in terms of ability to focus, ability to be organized, um, and even moods. Um, and all of that's still going on, and the research is, is pretty clear that that's being impacted also by nicotine. Um, the, the most recent article I could find from the Academy of Pediatrics was really clear. Nicotine should be outlawed, banned, whatever, um, until the age of 21. I mean, that was what their comment was in terms of the health um, hazard it's, per, it's um providing, and, and again, along the order of brain development and what it's doing. Um, the other piece of it, and, and I've heard young people having this conversation, oh, I'm only vaping, it's not like I'm smoking a cigarette. And there are some numbers out there that show that kids are vaping because they think it's okay, and they say, oh, I never smoke, but I'm vaping. And so um, it's then leading them into other drugs. So. I'm going to support this when it comes to the full board, although I'm not a member of this committee. Um, you know, pediatricians will tell you they can't give certain drugs to young people because it's not good for their bodies. Um, and I think this is one of those drugs we need to look at and look at what it does to the individuals who are consuming it. Thank you. Alderman Wilshire. Thank you. I, I came into the committee tonight thinking I was not going to support this ordinance. And now I have my doubts. I may and I may not support it. I mean, I have until next week to really figure it out because I don't have to vote tonight. I'm not on the committee. Um, I, I kind of agree with Alderman Clemens, and then I agree with, you know, so there's so much to take in. You know, do I think we're taking away people's rights? Yes, I do. And, and is someone at 18 years old able to make their own decisions? I believe they are. Um, but, you know, when I heard people in the audience talking about kids in school and, you know, it, it, it kind of sways my decision a little bit. So I don't know how I'm going to come down on this one. Alderman Kelly. Thank you. Um, I'll echo what um, Alderman uh, Will Shire was saying, I almost called you Lopez. I'm, and I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I've been torn on this. I have. And I think I really want to say thank you to everybody who's come, brought their testimony for the chief for coming. I, you know, we have business owners who I frequent. Um, I am, I like cigars. Um, but where I'm coming down currently, because I, I actually was surprised by some of the testimony as well. I wasn't sure where students were going to fall on this. Um, I'm going to support this, and I have a list of reasons why. Um, one of the things that was brought up that I think is really critical is the point of access. So an 18-year-old <coughs> can still be in high school, which means they have access to people who are younger than 18, where suddenly you put it at 21, and it's a little bit harder for them to find someone to get them the vaping piece or the cigarettes. Um, the Telegraph did an informal poll, obviously not comprehensive, but there was a lot of support. I think it was like 64%. Um, I think the students who came to speak tonight and also the educators um, that talked about, especially vaping being such a problem, that was really hard to argue with. I mean, you saw that woman's bag full of stuff. That was, that was a hefty bag. Um, and then I think we, we've heard from a lot of prominent health leaders 
school leaders, doctors, and they're all very much in support of this. Um, one of the things that came through our um, email today was this idea that Needham did this. And I know I was concerned about, well, someone will just go to Hudson, right? So Needham did this, all the towns around them were still allowing it, and they still saw a 47% reduction in the amount of smoking that was happening at the high schools. Uh, that's a, that, I think that's, how do you argue with that? That's, that's pretty big. Um, and then, then I think maybe the most surprising to me was the actual industry itself saying, um, we must do this. There was a full page ad um, where they said, raise it to 21. They're doing it in Utah, we're okay with this. And this was Juul. Um, and then there was an opinion piece that was sent to me where a CEO of a very large corporation was saying the same thing. So I don't, li I don't like making tough decisions like this, but that's what we're here for. And I think that we have a range of responsibilities as an alderman, right? We might be picking out whether or not to put a stop sign or fill a pothole, and sometimes it's about taking a stance. Um, I ideally would love to see it at the state level. I really would. I think that would be a, ste a step in the right direction. A lot of the states around us have done that, but they are dragging their feet. And I think it's time for us um, to make that stance and, and help lead the conversation. Alderman Clement. Thank you. I think what this is going to do is make criminals out of 18-year-olds, and I'm not for that. I understand and I'm sympathetic to the issues that are going on in schools. When I was in school, when I was in middle school, it was a junior high back then, kids smoked. They smoked on the playgrounds. They smoked inside, um, you know, the bathrooms and stuff like that. That was when I was in seventh grade. Um, you know, it, this stuff's been going on for years. And it's, it's an adolescent thing. <coughs> and it is unlikely to be curbed or prevented. You might prevent some of them from doing it. But it's still going to happen. And, you know, it's funny to hear the comments that I hear because it seems to me that it's an education problem uh, and not so much a problem from, you know, a point of sale. Because what everybody here, what I've heard is, well, I didn't know that this was bad for me. Well, that's an education problem. How do you not know that putting a chemical inside your lungs and exhaling it is not good for you? I, I don't know. I don't understand that. Uh, to me, that's, that's a matter of you, we need to get a better message across. Um, but I don't think the way to do that is by, you know, I don't think that the way, right way to do that is to tell adults who have the ability to make decisions such as whether or not to join the army and, or, or the military and defend their country, go over to Afghanistan and die in a battlefield at the age of 19. But we're going to tell them, yeah, you can make that decision. You can vote for your commander in chief. You can vote for me. You can't buy a cigarette, though. I have a problem with that. I have a big problem with that. I have a problem with the drinking age being 21. I think it should be 18. I have a problem with that. You're an adult. You're 18 years old. That is what we have decided an adult is. Now. I'm not going to suggest that we, you know, reduce the age of the drinking age to 18 because I think that that would be culturally unacceptable and I would never support such a thing. But personally, I have a problem with it because to me, if you are going to give somebody the responsibility to vote, which by the way, is your number one, in my opinion, your number one civic obligation is to vote. If we say that somebody who is 18 years old has that right and ability to make that decision, well, then they should be able to make every other decision as well. Um, and I just can't support taking away somebody's 
right to make a decision for themselves uh, along those lines. Now, I understand the medical issues. I understand that it's bad for your health. And I think, and I would support doing more education in the schools behind this. I would support, um, you know, making this more of a public awareness uh, campaign. But, uh, you know, I, I can't support raising the age uh, to 21. I just can't. It philosophically rubs me the wrong way. Okay, Alderman Lopez, then Alderwoman Kelly, and then Alderman Laws. Um, so education can only happen in a culturally supportive environment. If we as adults are contradicting, as leaders, we're saying we're still not going to make a move on this, kids are not going to listen to books that tell them one thing or numbers because we're seeing that example right here where a doctor can come up and tell us this stuff is dangerous and it's poison, and our inclination socially is still to say nothing can be done, there's going to be a problem with it, if any plan has a flaw in it, we shouldn't do it, and to try to blow it into larger issues because that's our natural inclination culturally. So there is an importance to making this stand in Nashville particularly because it will enhance the education being delivered. The CDC specifically says multiple strategies should be pursued, including all of the following. It includes raising the age to 21, and it includes education. So they're not mutually exclusive. They're codependent. You need to address the system of a person who is younger and encounters nicotine and starts using it regularly, harmlessly through, with a semblance of harmlessness through vaping, and then maybe starts um, using it more regularly, as the young man described, loses their vaping device because the school collected it, um, and then switches over to cigarettes so they can curb that craving, and now they're doing, there's a progression here, and there's a culture, and there's a community, and there are obviously associations and socialization happening completely around this. Castro's isn't just a store where you just walk in and leave with your product. It's comfortable. There's, there's the game on. There's people there hanging out. You're in a social environment downtown. So I'm not disputing, particularly you know, on my side, that that is part of our culture. And I do think it would be excessive to entirely ban nicotine. If we think we're going to have trouble collecting guns, try banning nicotine. Watch a bunch of people who are in withdrawal over nicotine and see what they do. I, I would, that's not going to happen. What we can do is we can take micro steps here to identify the most vulnerable populations and advocate for them as adults the same way we do put in stop signs and say, hey, don't, don't just drive into the intersection you know, recklessly. Um, I, I agree that there is the semblance that we could be criminalizing um, younger kids, but I would also point out that we're talking about a $50 fine. And we're talking about kids who are already doing it. Like 18 and 19 year olds are giving nicotine products to younger kids. They are dealing. This reduces the likelihood of that actually happening to the youngest populations, the more ridiculous level of 14, 15, um, and 16, by adding a social agent that says, okay, look, there's less of you all collecting like within four years, five years or more of each other, you don't have the guy that you knew, you know, who was a junior last year and is now a senior and has the cigarettes and you're in the same school. There's less of that because we're spreading the age out. So there's the social determinant here and it's based on a lot of study and a lot of statistics. It's based on precedents that are used elsewhere. The challenge is gonna be, culturally speaking, we're live free or die, emphasis on die. We weren't really quick about even just putting in airbags we, I, I'm, if memory serves, we only made 16 the marrying age maybe two or three years ago. So before that, it was like 14 if, you're, if you're, you know, parents will sign off on it. So New Hampshire is not a progressive liberal front. In this particular case, we have a clear call to action, and we can take it. I, don't, I mean, I can't save the whole world, but I only represent Nashua. Alderman Kelly. Um, just a few comments uh, to some of the comments that have been made since I spoke. Um, I was interested to see where 18-year-olds where fell. Uh, I was a little bit worried about this, but not a single 18-year-old showed up and said, you're taking away my rights. I mean, every person, <coughs> not a single one. I was expecting a, a line of them saying that. Um, I was. Um, 
it may save a few. I think it's worth it if it saves a few. And then <laughs> I'm probably going to regret saying this. Um, I, I agree that education needs to happen. I'm in marketing. I know how effective marketing is. A lot of us are psychology double majors. Our job is to manipulate people. And right now, people are out there saying vaping is okay, and, and kids are eating that up. They're believing it because that's the culture. And it used to be the culture. Joe Camel was the culture that sold cigarettes to kids, and we got rid of that. So I think we really need to consider that it is a very strong pull, especially for young people. Chief, do you have something to add? If I could, uh, <laughs> sure. without being asked a question, if I could uh, make a comment. Uh, you know, certainly I've listened to everything. And, you know, when I say, you know, we have no trouble enforcing it, that's our job. We most certainly will enforce it. But I, I, I did want to emphasize the point of discretion. And, and I can assure you that, you know, I'm not pulling my pop unit right now in this opioid ep epidemic to check IDs in the cigar shops, quite frankly. That's not going to happen. And we're not sending undercover narcotics people in, into the, the cigar shops, you know, to see if there's undercover, uh, you know, if there's underage people in there, uh, you know, buying a cigar. So, I mean, it's a city ordinance. We'll certainly do our job. But, you know, I just don't want anyone to get the impression we're locking people up for this. It's a city ordinance. It's a fine. And, again, I, you know, you make it an ordinance, we'll enforce it. That's our job. But discretion is a, is a big part of that. And we understand that, you know, we work for the, the entire, uh, you know, population of Nashua. And, and, again, we're not doing alpha strikes on anybody's business. Uh, certainly not without 100 people going, you know, hard evidence that they're, they're violating the city ordinance. Alderman Dowd. Yes, Chief. Two quick things to Alderman Clement's comments before. Our age restrictions in this country are are strange to say the least. There's a federal law that says you cannot buy a handgun unless you're 21 years old. But here in the state of New Hampshire, you can carry it on you without a permit at 18. Mm -hmm. How much sense does that make? I don't know how you enforce that, Chief. Um, Definitely not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I got a gun, but I don't own it because I didn't buy it, you know. You can't buy the ammunition, but you can carry the gun. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So, and, and there's a lot of instances of that. Uh, uh, I agree. If a guy's going to fight in combat, you know, taking a cigarette or a cigar away from him, particularly while he's in the military, is, is crazy. But I got to believe that the police department's going to use a lot of discretion. You know, you know, we talked about the handgun if you're in the past parking lot in Massachusetts. Did you know, I'm sure you know, that if I'm in New Hampshire and I have a gun and I go through Massachusetts to New York, that's fine. You can still carry it in Massachusetts. It's a federal law. It says you, you don't, don't stop in Massachusetts. I was going to say, you, you may, have to keep going. You might not want to tell the Massachusetts <laughs> authorities that. <laughs> because that was just a court case that was in the paper. But anyway, so there's a lot of crazy things like that. Um, you know, I, the couple of exceptions that I mentioned and I would like to see, but basically I'm in support of it. Anyone else? Alderman Jetty and then Alderman Lopez. I'll, I'll defer to Alderman Lopez since he's on the committee. Uh, I just it wanted to defend the police chief's honor a little bit here and say I walk up and down the rail trail at least 30 times a day. There's an above average amount of day drinking, like... I guess if it was a golf course, that would be fine, but whatever. Um, and the police are not locking people up for day drinking. They're just pouring out their beer or having them pour out their beers and, and asking them not to do it there and not to do that. They're not heavy-handed. They're really good at engaging the community and spotting bigger and more important issues when it's like necessary or appropriate to do it. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, but the idea also just occurred to me that there's a difference between losing your little natty daddy and your ability to go get another one later and just go reoffend somewhere else and losing the e-cigarette, which is expensive, especially when you're talking about someone who's 18 to 21. That might actually make a difference in their pattern because they can't easily replace that. And if they're early enough in their use, that might be an intervention that redirects what they do. They might decide it's too much trouble. Okay. Alderman Jetty. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I'll be. Uh, I'll try not to re repeat anything that's been said before, but I, I, I did want to point out um, that um, you know, even though I think everybody, um, I think everybody agrees that the medical <coughs> evidence that um, that uh, smoking and vaping uh, for people under 21 is is a bad idea and and shouldn't be done. Um, and it's it's a matter of, um, you know, is do we, do we pass this law, which um, uh, in, in Nashua to uh, prevent um, people between eighteen and tw and twenty eighteen and twenty to uh, purchase this uh, for the stores to sell it to them and uh, for them to give it to other people and and for them to possess it. Um, you know what? Uh, you know what purpose uh, does that serve? Um, well, the uh, the research shows that raising the age to 21 is effective. It does prevent. Uh, it does reduce the uh, tobacco use among people under 21. Um, not only the 18, 19, and 20 years olds, but the the younger kids. And you know they're getting it from those 18, 19, and 20 year olds. And you know the research shows that an 18, well, the fact that the 18 year olds are still in high school, and you know they can legally buy the stuff and bring it to the school or bring it to wherever they are and give it to their friends. 21 year olds don't typically hang around with uh, high school kids or middle school kids. Um, so it does, uh, you know, m making it illegal for people under 21 to, to purchase this does, does have the effect of, of reducing uh, its use by the, by the younger kids. Um, you know, and this is based on, on research. You know, uh, Alderman Kelly mentioned uh, uh, Needham, uh, but everywhere, you know, this is not, we're not the first uh, city to consider doing this. This has been done all over the country. And it started with cities doing it, towns. Um, in Massachusetts, it started with Needham. The other towns saw how effective it was. Um, and even and when Needham uh, did it, they reduced, uh, even though they were surrounded by towns that, that where people could buy it at 18, they had a significant reduction in its use in, in Needham. Other towns saw that success rate. They adopted it themselves. They raised the age. There was like 221 towns and cities in Massachusetts which, which raised the age, including Boston. Um, finally, the Massachusetts legislature uh, raised the age statewide. Um, similarly, in other states, you know, now, uh, Hawaii, California, Oregon, Utah, um, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Maine, um, and most recently uh, Virginia, where tobacco started, uh, have raised the age to 21. Uh, cities, you know, New York City, a lot of other cities in New York State, uh, Washington, D.C., Chicago, uh, they've all considered the same thing. They've all had the same debate. Will it do any good to just do it uh, <laughs> in Chicago, for example, when the, the suburbs around it still are, eight, are 18? <laughs> and, and they decided, based on the success rate that, that this has had and has been shown, they decided to do it uh, as well. Um, you know, even... Uh, uh, and, and, and you know, even the uh, tobacco company, you know, Al Altria, which is one of the, you know, it's the old Philip Morris company, one of the the old Marlboro, you know, they made Marlboros. Uh, you know, they re recently um, uh, had an editorial uh, where the CEO of Altria said that Altria favored raising the age to twenty one. Uh, You've heard Jewel is also doing the same, has done the same thing, the vaping people, uh, because they recognize that uh, that raising the age does reduce the amount 
of uh, tobacco use or tobacco related product use by the by younger people um, and you know when when towns do it it eventually <laughs> leads to states doing it uh, you know I agree when people say you know New Hampshire ought to do it statewide I agree uh, there was a bill before the Senate that I went up and testified in favor of um, uh, but they, uh, they held it in committee. They didn't pass it. Uh, two years ago, uh, it, it, uh, the Senate uh, defeated a bill to raise the age. So uh, it would be great if the state did it. Uh, but they haven't done it. They've had chances, and they haven't done it. And I don't think Nashua, uh, what the state did do is this, the law that makes it 18 also says that the local towns and cities can adopt a more stringent provision. They can raise the age to 21. So the state legislature has told us, uh, we're not ready to do it statewide, but you have the authority to do it. You can do it in Nashua if you want to. And I think we should. I think, if, and if, you know, Dover did it, Keene did it, New Market has done it, and I think if, if Nashua did it, there's some other places that are uh, are looking at it if we do it if other places do it I you know it would be it would help get the state legislature to say well you know maybe you know maybe we should do it statewide as they've done in Maine as they've done in Massachusetts and in a lot of other states um, you know I, uh, as far as uh, local businesses are concerned again the research shows that you know, we're just talking about 18, 19, and 20 year olds. Uh, 21 to 121, they're still available. There's, there are customers that are still out there. Um, and the research has shown that the percentage that the 18, 19, and 20 year olds represent is just 2% of total sales. So 2% is not is not going to uh, make anybody go out of business. In fact, <coughs> the, you know, there are articles uh, uh, that show <laughs> that the places that have done this, no business is, nobody's gone out of business. Uh, they've all survived. It rep it's a small number of their sales. It's not going to uh, put anybody out of business. Um, and, you know, I understand and appreciate how passionate you are about Alderman Clemens, about you know personal choice. And if if an, if we've said that adults are 18, then they ought to be able to make their own choices. I, I understand that argument, um, but I I also want to point out to you that uh, that you know we we discriminate against 18 year olds in many ways. Uh, you talk about the right to vote. Um, they can vote at 18, but they can't, they can't run for state senate, they can't run for executive council, they can't run for governor, they can't run for any federal office. Um, they can't <coughs> rent a car. They can't get a commercial driver's license to carry hazardous material. And I agree that's wrong. <laughs> well, you may think so, but... But the, you know, the law has made, uh, made, has made distinctions about people. And the same thing with, you know, I, I heard you say that you think that, the, uh, that, our, uh, that raising the age to, to consume alcohol or buy alcohol to 21, you think uh, you, you didn't agree with that. But, I, but we've done it for very good reasons. When, when the law was lowered from 21 to 18, there was there was it was a disaster. There were a lot more accidents. A lot more people were killed. A lot more people were injured. Um, a lot more people got into trouble because of uh, consuming alcohol. And we we finally saw the light and raised it up to 21. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do here. Is just raising that age to 21. We, you know, the 21 year olds can still uh, consume. Uh, you know, tobacco products and, and, and vaping, we're just targeting those young kids. And, um, you know, it's not foolproof. I know 
that um, uh, people say, you know, they'll be able to go to Hudson and buy it. And, and you know, you've pointed out that when you were younger, you know, kids, you know, kids got, got a hold of stuff. They probably got a hold of beer, <laughs> alcohol, uh, even though it was illegal. Uh, but, but a lot of kids didn't. A lot of kids, you know, they weren't able to walk into a store and buy it, so they weren't able to get it. And uh, if we can save, you know, Needham reduced it by 47%. If we could reduce the, the, uh, our kids uh, starting on the road of addiction to nicotine by 47%, by half, uh, I think that would be a wonderful thing, and I think it's well worth doing, even if it's 25%, even if it's 10%. Saving some kids... Um, I think is, is well worth doing. And I think, you know, Nashua can take the lead, show the rest of the state that we value our children, and, um, and hopefully other towns, including Hudson, Merrimack, Hollis, will adopt similar provisions, and um, it'll be, get, be even more har uh, harder for kids in Nashua to, to obtain, uh, obtain these products. So... Um, I, I understand Alderman Clemens's position, and it doesn't sound like he's going to change, but I hope you, Madam Chairman, would vote uh, in favor so that, um, uh, so that this could be recommended to the full board and let the full board deal with it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. So I'm only going to take two minutes. Um, I was not in favor of this because, truthfully, I felt that it was the responsibility of our state, with 400 people up there, to represent this community as well as this state as a whole, and that they should have raised the age to 21. The second thing is, I wish we could ban e-cigarettes and vaping totally from the city, because I think that has been a real big issue uh, for our community and other communities as well. On the other hand, I understand the two cigar stores, and I kind of agree with Alderman Dowd. I wish there was some way we could allow them, if there was an 18 or 19-year-old that wanted to go into their establishment, eat, and have a cigar, that that wouldn't be a problem. But I think that would make this um, resolution a little bit more complicated, maybe difficult for the police, and we certainly don't want to do that. I appreciate all the testimony. I think um, you did your homework. Um, I think I agree with Alderman Clemens in some respects. I just wish we could come to an agreement that the whole country goes to age 21. We should have banned tobaccos 40 years ago when that came out in Alderman Kelly, it wasn't Joe Camel that brought people to smoke. It was the Marlboro man. <laughs> One of them, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Fair. They all died. <laughs> so anyway, I, I appreciate it. And um, whatever your testimony was for or against, understand that we as a board have to do what we think is best for our community at large, no matter whether we agree or disagree. We have to do what's the right thing for the community. So, huh, I will vote for this in committee and uh, let's move it forward. So do we have any other conversation concerning what is that? 0 19037, Alderman Laws. April Fools. April Fools, thank you. Okay, are we ready to vote? Anything else? Okay, committee members, all in favor of the motion to pass the tobacco age from 18 to 21? Please say aye. 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 Any nays? Nay. Okay, Alderman Clemens. Okay, so this will go to the full board next week, and I thank you all for coming. Do we have any discussion?
Public comment. Do we have anyone in the, thank you, Chief, for coming. Anyone from the public? Okay, remarks by the Alderman. Alderman Lopez. Um, I just want to express my condolences to the, um, the communities at Riviera University, um, Bishop Garten, and all the people who knew Brother Paul Demers. He passed uh, over the weekend. He was uh, an can inspirational we, person. Can we please have quiet? The meeting's still on. Thank you. Go ahead, Alderman Lopez. So anyway, I would like to express those condolences. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Okay, I just want to remind you that I will have Sue Lovering uh, take a poll and remind you that we'll have a meeting in two weeks at 6, 615 to talk about the um, resolution. Which one? The voter law changing thing? Oh, yeah. 073, yeah, R-18-073, okay? All the women, Kelly. I just wanted to move to adjourn. Alderman <laughs> Kelly wants to move to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned at 10.50. Oh Welcome. Goodness.